a service of KIBMRadio.com, the Internet's home for an all-old-time radio. the circus. Jerry of the Circus. Is he Jerry? <laughs> Look out the window here. What for, Bump? You can't see anything. It's too dark. Well, you can see that automobile road alongside the tracks. Golly, it's all underwater. Mm-hmm. The lights from the windows of our train shine on it. <laughs> Looks almost like a river. More like a river than an automobile road. Well, this part of the country is famous for heavy rains. <laughs> Boy, I'm sure glad we missed that last one. Have you been noticing how the train rocks back and forth? Yeah, I sure have, Jerry. Well, that's because the roadbed's been underwater recently. Well, isn't it dangerous to travel over it? Oh, guess not, Jerry. You notice we're going along pretty slow. The engineer knows his road mighty well. He's not going to take any chances. But that telegram Mr. Randall got from the railroad company said it was dangerous. Well, that was referring to the bridge or trestle. It's an old one, and they're not so sure it'll hold our heavy load. Oh, when do we get to it? Well, let's see. Oh, about... Oh, it's half past now. Let's see. Oh, I guess we ought to be getting there pretty soon now. Mr. Randall said he was going to examine the bridge, and if it really is weak, he was going to find another way to get the circus to the next town. <laughs> yeah, that's just like Sam. He'll go through most anything not to disappoint folks, even take a chance of breaking part of his show. But how will we get across the bridge? Don't guess we'll get across. We won't hold the train, but he'll figure something out. He always does. We're slowing down now. Yes, here we are, Jerry. We must be getting close to that trestle. <laughs> Well, come in. Yeah, what are you two doing up this hour? Come on, Mr. Randall. Well, Jerry here wanted to stay up and see what this weak bridge is all about, Sam. You sure take a keen interest in this outfit, Jerry. I love the circus, Mr. Randall. It's my home and everything. And if it wasn't for you and the circus, I don't know where I'd be now. Well, I guess you'd be in an orphanage, Jerry. Yeah, that's where I'd be. I'm glad to see you take such an interest in the show. I did the same thing when I was a boy. Oh, oh say, I guess we're up to that trestle, Sam. Oh, yeah. Well, I better get out there and look it over. Can I come with you, Mr. Randall? I bet you can. Come on. You want to go, Rag? Well, see you later, Bob. Yeah, okay, Sam. Now, now watch your step out there, Jerry. Oh, I will. Bye. How far are we from the next stand, Mr. Randall? Well, something like 15 miles, Jerry. It's going to be a long haul if we can't cross this trestle. Oh, what do we do? I mean... How will we get to the next town? Well, that's something that uh, will have to be figured out. Coming, Rags? You, Mr. Randall? Uh, yeah. Quiet, Rags. I'm the brakeman. Oh, yeah. I don't think we'd better take a chance crossing here. I just had a talk with the engineer, and he doesn't think we can make it. Mm, I thought they were going to reinforce the trestle. Well, they had a crew on it until midnight. But the ground is so water-soaked, the pilings don't hit bottom. Mm. There's much can be done till the ground dries up. Well, that's that. Any other bridges across this river? There's a wagon bridge down yonder. Oh, oh yeah, yeah, I see it. Just a wooden one. 
It's awful steep going down to it. Yeah. Well, I guess that's our only hope. Well, what do you mean, Mr. Randall? Well, we'll have to unload here and use the horses and the bull elephants to get us into town. I'll tell the engineer to uncouple them. Okay. I guess that's all we can do. Won't the elephants break the bridge? Well, we'll have to test it, Jerry. How? Now, yeah, come on. Let's get Olsen. You'll we'll see. Sure, Come on, boys. Will it take a long time to get to the town? Uh, even if we can get across the little bridge? Oh, that's the trouble, Jerry. I'm afraid we'll be plenty late setting up this day. Then the matinee will be late starting, won't it? Yeah, sure will, but we'll be lucky to do a show at all. Now, here's Olsen's car. Come on. Where's Rags? He's right here. Oh, okay. Everybody is sleeping and don't even know about all the trouble. Yeah, yeah here we are. Olsen! Olsen, come on, wake up! Yeah. Well, uh, we in? Uh, no, not all the way. We've run into some grief. Oh, what's the matter? Uh, can't make it across the Horn River Trestle. Come on, get your bulls unloaded, and we've got a long haul ahead. We'll be with you right away. Sounds bad, boy. Uh, it may be bad. I'm just taking a chance that uh, that little wooden bridge will hold our load. Want me to send Gertie over to test it? Yeah. Oh, so that's how you test the bridge. Oh, hello there, Jerry. I didn't see you standing there in the doorway. Oh, Mr. Olsen. <laughs> and Rags. <laughs> hello there, fella. Well, I'll see you down to Carlson. Hurry it up. Come on, Jerry. Okay, I'll have my herd off in a few minutes. Where are we going now, Mr. Randall? Yeah, we'll go get Paul now and see uh, so that he can get his men out. You mean Paul Murray? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, where does he sleep? Right here in this car. Come on, Rags. <laughs> Don't oh, bark, Jerry. That's as good a way to make, wake up the men as any. Here we are. Paul, come on. Up and at him. Okay, be right with you. Oh, oh it's you, Mr. Randall. Yeah. Well, good morning. Yeah, we're going to have, have to move the show from here, Paul. Uh, where are we? Well, let's see. Uh, why, well, we're not in yet. No, no, we're about 15 miles from town. Can't get across the Horn River Trestle. I'll have to haul in somehow. Well, I'll be dressed in a minute. Get your men up, Paul. See you outside. Okay, boss. Come on, Jerry. I'm right with you, Mr. Randall. Well, the first thing we have to do is to see if that little bridge is strong enough. Aren't you going to wake up everybody now? Oh, no, Jerry. No use getting the performers up yet. Oh, you get them all over the town. Well, I'll send some buses over for them uh, after we all get the equipment moved. Oh, look. Uh, there's Olsen now. Where are you coming, Olsen? I'll have Gertie out in a minute. Hey, Spike. You and uh, Rusty, put up that ramp. They sure work fast, Mr. Randall. Yeah, but we won't have any time to spare, no matter how fast they work today. I'll get dirty now, boss. You order the baggage, Doc? Yeah, everybody's awake. All right. Oh, you're dirty, don't you, Ray? Yeah, here she comes, Jerry. Come on, Gertie. That's a nice girl. Come on now. That's the way. Come on there. There we are. Hey, Rusty! Yeah? Uh, bring a couple of more of those lanterns. Okay, boss. Uh, which way, Mr. Randall? Right over here. See the road? Leads right down to that little bridge. Oh, yeah. Uh-huh. Hey, it's pretty steep grade down there. Yeah, uh, not so steep on the other side, though. That's a help. <laughs> you can't scare Gertie and she don't want to play. <laughs> Looks like Rags picked on a pretty big playmate. <laughs> Easy, girl, now. Come on, take it easy. That's the way. Take your time. Look out. Take your time. Step, Mr. Randall. Yeah, yeah, she makes pretty sure of her footing when she can't see where she's going. Hmm. Well, there's the bridge. Not a very big one, but I guess you'd call it a bridge. How is Gertie going to test the bridge? Uh, you'll see. Uh, here we are. Come on, Gertie. Easy there, now. Easy, girl. Yeah, I think the bridge will take the load okay. It looks pretty strong. Yes, it looks okay, boss. Yeah, you see? There she goes. Gertie's not stopping. What does he mean by that, Mr. Randall? Well, Gertie's the head elephant, Jerry. She won't go across unless she knows it'll take her weight. They sort of feel how strong the thing is as they step along. She wouldn't cross it unless she was absolutely sure of it. Yes, and none of the other elephants will go across if Gertie refuses. You couldn't drive them over. Golly, they sure are smart. Well, you satisfied, Orson? Yep. Yeah, we'll run the herd over now, and if it holds them, we can move the whole show over without any worry. All right. Hey, up there, bring the rest of the bulls down. You up there, Paul? Right. Uh, bring your mess wagons down right up to the bulls. Right on their heels. Here they come. Yeah. Well, you and Rags, be careful now, Jerry. Keep clear. Oh, my God. Bring them right over, Rusty. All right, here they come, Gertie. He's telling them to go get across over, huh? <laughs> yeah, I guess that's it. She's letting them know she got over okay. 
Yeah, this bridge being here and being strong enough is sure a lifesaver. It'll be a mighty long, tough haul, though. Here comes the first wagon. Mm-hmm. Now, as soon as we get all the mess wagons over, I take the bulls back up for the heavy hauling, Olson. Okay, boss. I'll go along with the first wagon to some place where I can get an automobile. And then go on into town and send some buses back for the performance. Shall I go with you? Oh, no, Jerry, no. You go back up to your car and go to bed for an hour or so. You and Bumps can come over with the rest of the folks in a, in a bus. All right, hold it. Hold that wagon. I'm riding with you. Okay, boss. All right, Olson. Yeah? Uh, tell Jim Bennett my plans. Tell him to pass the word around. Okay, boss. And you go right up to your car, Jerry, and get out of the way. All right, Mr. Randall, I will. Come on, Nick. All right, Joe. Hey! Well, Jerry, say, that was quite an experience for you last night, wasn't it? Oh, say, golly, Mr. Randall is sure smart, isn't he, Bob? <laughs> he sure is. I have the first time to see him stumped. We won't be so very late, will we? Well, I'm ready to go on now. I mean, the show won't be awful late, will it? Well, now, let's see. Oh, I'd say just about an hour late. There are lots of folks waiting at the main gate already. Why don't they let them into the menagerie until everything is ready under the big top? Well, I guess that's what's holding them up, Jerry. They just put the last of the animal cages in there a minute ago. Oh, Kelly will let them in as soon as they're all set. I bet those razorbacks and hostlers and all the men that worked all night are sure tired. Yeah, to say nothing of the horses and the elephants. Those animals sure did a wonderful job, Jerry. Yeah, and they were sure thirsty this morning. Well, why do you help me with the watering? Mm-hmm. Did you have your breakfast? I didn't see you in the mess tent. Sure, I ate early and got right over to the horse. <coughs> What's the matter, eh? Hey, he sees something outside the door. Look at it. It's Johnny Bradley and Slats and Hooligan. And there's the bearded lady with them. Yeah. See, she's all excited about something. I think I'll just step out there and see what's going on. No, Rags, you can't go. You stay right here. I should think you'd have had enough excitement for one day. It isn't every dog gets to see all you did last night. Elephants testing bridges and all that. Why, you're a lucky dog. Yes, you are. I guess you know it, too. What is it, Bumps? What's the matter? I'll tell you in just a minute, Jerry. Rags, be good now. See, it looks pretty bad, Jerry. What's the matter? Tell me. Well, you know how much the bearded lady thinks a major might. Yes, yeah, she sure likes him all right. Well, uh, the poor woman is frantic. The major is missing. Missing? What do you mean, boss? Well, he's the only one not accounted for. They've looked all over for him. Everybody on the lot is looking for him, and, and Mr. Randall is upset about it. But where could he be? You think he got lost back of the bridge? Well, I don't know, Jerry, but this is not so good, having Major Mike disappear. <laughs>
Ladies and gentlemen, the story you are about to hear is true. The names have been changed to protect the innocent. You're a detective sergeant. You're assigned the burglary detail. You get a call that someone has broken into a necktie manufacturer's. A large supply of hand-painted ties have been stolen. Your job? Check it out. It was Saturday, September 10th. It was hot in Los Angeles. We were working the day watch out of burglary detail. My partner's Frank Smith. The boss is Captain Bernard. My name's Friday. I was on my way into the office, and it was 8.31 a.m. when I got to room 45. Burglary. Hi, Joe. Flying. Anything for us? A uh, patrol car picked up a couple of high school kids about 3 a.m. Oh? Found them hanging around a filling station over on Jefferson. Mm-hmm. Juvenile's checking them against those other filling station jobs last week. Just to let us know. Okay. All right, it's going to be a scorcher. Yeah. You noticed it last night? Hmm? The heat. Oh, yeah, sure I did. I don't think I slept more than 30 minutes. wonder about air conditioning the house. What? It's pretty expensive, isn't it? Well, I guess it depends, doesn't it? Yeah. Be worth it, though, weather like this. Well, we don't get these spells too often. Well, I don't know, Joe. Lots of the new houses have air conditioning. Yeah. Just the bedroom might not cost too much. You know, one of those portable units. Mm Mm-hmm. I get it. Burglary Friday. Yes, sir. Just a second. All right, what's the address? All right. Mm Mm-hmm. Yes, sir, I see. Right away. Bye. Tie manufacturing company out on Western. Somebody cleaned them out last night. Over a hundred dozen neckties. Yeah. Owner says he knows who did it. Frank and I drove out to a small manufacturing shop on Southwestern Avenue. 9.03 a.m., we interviewed the owner, George Prosper. He told us the back door had been forced open during the night and that a large supply of hand-painted neckties had been stolen. You see right here? The lock's broken. Yes, sir. That's how he got in. No mistake about it. Uh Uh-huh. You take anything else beside the ties? Oh, a little cash, $80, $90. But the ties are the important thing. Uh Oh? Yeah, they're worth at least $5 a piece retail, all hand-painted, you know. Yes, sir. Some of them are worth more special designs. Why is that? Well, they're made up for the individual, one of a kind. Oh, I see. Of course, most of the ties he stole weren't specials. They were from our wholesale stock, Christmas orders. Mm Mm-hmm. I'll admit it doesn't feel very much like Christmas today, but we have to get our orders filled before the end of October. Mm-hmm. I certainly hope you'll be able to get the ties back for us in time. Yes, sir. Now, you said you had an idea who the thief might be. Yeah, that's right. Uh, Morgan Gilroy. Well, who's he? Young fellow used to work for me. I let him go first last week. Uh-huh. Just wasn't dependable. Always late in the morning. Careless worker, too. Now, why do you blame him for the burglary? Well, he was very upset when I fired him. Said his wife was having a baby. Said I didn't have any right to let him go without notice. I see. Told him I'd warn him off enough. Gave him a whole week's pay, and that seemed more than fair to me. Did he say anything else? Well, yeah, he threatened me. Oh. Said I'd be sorry I fired him. Said I'd live to regret it. Uh-huh. Made quite a scene. Told him if he didn't get out, I'd call the police. Did he leave then? Well, not right away. He quieted down some, asked me to change my mind and keep him on. Said he couldn't be out of work now, that he had to have a job and kind of the baby. Uh-huh. I told him there are plenty of jobs to be had. If a man really wants work, he can find it. Yeah. Different when I was his age. Had to earn your wages. Mm-hmm. And he'd take young fellas like Gilroy, careless, irresponsible, always looking for shortcuts, always looking for an easy dollar. Never give value in return. Yeah. That's why I'm sure it was him. Just the sort of stunt he'd pull, the easy way to earn a dollar. Well, then he's got something to learn, hasn't he? Hmm? This was the hard way. Frank and I called the crime lab. While they checked the premises, we continued to interview the victim, George Prosper. He gave us a description of the suspect, Morgan Gilroy, and Gilroy's home address. They also gave us a detailed description of the stolen property. 10.17 a.m. The lab reported that they were unable to find any useful fingerprints on the Jimmy door. Pictures of the Jimmy marks were taken. There was no other physical evidence. 10.57 a.m. Frank and I drove out to the address Prosper had given us. It was a small apartment house on Fountain Avenue in Hollywood. The Gilroy apartment was number seven. Yes? Morgan Gilroy in? No, he isn't. You Mrs. Gilroy? Yes, sir. We're police officers, ma'am. This is Frank Smith. My name's Friday. Pleased to meet you. Be all right if we come in for a minute? Oh, I guess it'll be all right. Thank you. I'm sorry I'm not fixed up. I kind of overslept this morning. Yes, ma'am. Were you out late last night, Mrs. Gilroy? No. How about your husband? What about him? Was he out late? Well. Don't you think you ought to tell me why you want to know? Police matter. Well, then maybe you'd better talk to Morgan. Yes, ma'am. Do you know where he is? At work. Now, where does he work, Mrs. Gilroy? 
For a tire manufacturer. Which one, do you know? Prosper's. George Prosper. That's the owner's name. Mm -hmm. How long has your husband worked for him? Six or seven months. And that's where he went this morning, did he? That's where he goes every morning. Mm -hmm. Something happened to Morgan? We'd like to talk to him, that's all. Then why don't you? I told you where you could find him. Yes, ma'am. The Prosper Tie Company. I don't know what the address is, but it's in the phone book. Oh, we just came from there, Miss Gilroy. Well, I don't understand. Didn't you see more? Your husband doesn't work for him anymore. What? He was let out last week. I, I don't believe you. That's what his boss told us. Well, if Morgan would have said something about it. No. Oh, you've made a mistake. You must be talking about a different person. No, ma'am. Well, it's got to be a mistake. Well, sure, Morgan gave me his paycheck last night. Every Friday night he gives me his paycheck. He got paid yesterday. The same as every week. Do you still have the check? No, not exactly. What do you mean? Well, it wasn't the check he gave me, not really. Oh. You see, he'd cashed it on his way home from work. I see. But it was the usual amount, $80. Mr. Prosper must have paid him. What time did your husband get home, Miss Gilroy? Well, last night? That's right. Well, he was later than usual. How late? If Morgan's in some kind of trouble, I've got a right to know. I've got a right, haven't I? I suppose you'd just answer our questions, would you? He wouldn't have done anything wrong. Not at a time like this. You see, we're... We're going to have a baby. Right. Morgan doesn't even think about anything else. He wants everything to be just perfect when the baby comes. That's why he couldn't have done anything wrong. Do you understand what I'm getting at? Yes, ma'am. That's why, whatever it is, well, it just has to be a mistake. Well, you can help us clear it up. All right. What time do you come home? About, about 2.15. A.M.? Yes, sir. Mm -hmm. Did he say where he'd been? He called from the shop about 5.30 yesterday afternoon. Said they had a rush shipment to get out, that he'd be working late. Told me not to wait up for him. Had he ever worked this late before? Once or twice. Not till 2.15, maybe, but till nearly midnight. Were you awake when he got home? Yes, sir. Then you're sure of the time, 2.15. Yes, sir, I'm sure. You see, I couldn't get to sleep. I was kind of worried about him. I guess I kept watching the clock. It was 2.15 when he came in. What did he say? He was kind of put out. Provoked about my still being awake. Said I ought to get my rest on account of the baby. Mm. I guess I sort of flared back. I said it was his fault on account of him being out so late. Oh, it wasn't a real fight or anything like that. Yes, sir. He said I oughtn't to blame him that we'd need all the extra money he could make. And he took out his wallet and gave me this week's pay, like I told you. Mm -hmm. Did he bring anything else home with him, Mr. Gilroy? With him? Extra clothes, ties, anything like that? No. You mind if I look around the apartment? Well, I know where everything is. If you'll tell me what you're looking for, maybe I can help you. Oh, that's all right. I can make that. Just the bedroom? Yes, the bed isn't made. Don't worry about it. I wasn't feeling very good this morning. Yes, ma'am. Would you like some coffee? No, ma'am. Thank you. And what about your friend? No, I don't think so. Did Mr. Crosper really say he fired Morgan? Yes, ma'am. Well, did he say why? Well, you better ask your husband about that. Just isn't fair. A time like this. Mm -hmm. You don't appreciate it, Morgan. Uh, the people he's worked for. Yeah. Man does his best. This is a thanks he gives. Miss Gilroy, these ties belong to your husband? Well, yes. You know where he got them? Sure, there's some he made at the shop. Samples. I see. Does he have any more of the same kind? I don't think so. Mm -hmm. Don't tell me all this fuss is about a couple of ties. Well, it's a few more than that, ma'am. Oh? A hundred dozen. Except for the three ties which Frank had found in the bedroom, we were unable to turn up anything else that seemed to answer the description of the stolen property. 12.15 p.m. Frank stayed at the Gilroy apartment to wait for the suspect while I drove back to the tie factory. George Prosper identified the ties taken from Gilroy's closet. He said that they were samples manufactured in his plant. He also said that they had been given to the suspect and had not been stolen. 1.36 p.m. I checked Gilroy's name through R&I. They had nothing on him. 2.17 p.m. I returned to the suspect's apartment. Hi, John. Hi. Any sign of him? No, not so far. Where's Miss Gilroy? She's lying down. Oh. She's taking this pretty hard when all the pieces after you left. That's a shame. I guess you can't blame her much. No. And the heat and all. She's bound to be upset. Find out anything? Well, these are Gilroy's time. Huh? Yeah. Prosper gave them to him. Says they're somewhat similar to the ones that were stolen, but they're not the same. Uh-huh. Now, you want to go out for a sandwich? Yeah, I guess so. You eat already? No, I wasn't hungry. Mm -hmm. Can I bring you back to him? Oh, milkshake, maybe. That'll do it. Okay. Doctor? Yeah, fine. I won't be long. Frank? Yeah? Miss Gilroy is all right, isn't she? Well, I guess so. Well, I mean, she doesn't need a doctor or anything like that. Well, I don't know, Joe. Well, you'd know more about it than I do. Well, I suppose if she needs a doctor, she'd call one. Yeah. 
Well, hurry it up anyway, will you? Sure. I thought I... Oh, you. Yes, ma'am. What happened to the other officer? We went out to get some lunch. Oh. You feeling better? Yes, thank you. The apartment's so stuffy today. I thought it was. Yes, ma'am. No, that isn't what it was at all. Ma'am? You and that other poison. You've got me so nervous, I don't know whether I'm coming or going. Well, I'm sorry we had to bother you. You're just wasting your time. Morgan won't be home before 6 o'clock. He never gets off work and... I can't seem to get it through my head that he's not at the shop. Yes, ma'am. Look, the minute he comes in, I'll telephone you. Or if I hear from him, I promise, the minute he comes in... Well, it might be better if we wait. Won't you try to believe me? Morgan's honest, completely honest. Yes, ma'am. He hasn't done anything wrong. If he had, I'd know it. He'd have told me. Well, there's one thing he didn't tell you, Miss Gilroy. Oh? That money he brought home last night. Well? Where it came from. <laughs> Frank and I waited in the apartment until the suspect, Morgan Gilroy, came home. 6.17 p.m., we took him into custody and drove him down to the city hall for questioning. He was very uncooperative and for nearly an hour refused to discuss his whereabouts the previous night. 7.08 p.m., we continued the interrogation. How'd you happen to lose your job last week, Gilroy? Ask the boss. He says you weren't dependable. That's his opinion. You afraid to tell your wife he fired you? Who says I didn't tell her? Did you? Well, maybe you'll feel more like talking in the morning. Morning? That's right. Well, you can't keep me down here tonight. Is that right? You want to drive Judy out of her mind? You saw how she acted when you guys took me in. Well, what are you trying to do to her? We're not doing anything to her, Gilroy. All we want is some straight answers from you. It wasn't enough losing my job just when I needed it the most. Now you guys got to crawl on my back, too. When did you get your last paycheck? From Prosper? Yeah. The day he fired me? That was last week sometime. I guess so. You gave your wife some money just last night. So? You told her it was this week's pay. Well, I had to tell her something, didn't yeah. I? Yeah. I didn't want her worrying about me being out of work. I had to tell her something. Where'd you get the money? Father. Yeah. Maybe it looked like I was stealing, but I wasn't. I was going to tell him I was taking it. It was just a loan. Until I started drawing unemployment. I thought we was buddies, Steve and me. Somebody turned you over to the cops for a lousy 80 bucks. Who's Steve? Steve McGill. Isn't that why you picked me up? When were you with us, McGill? Last night. What time? Five o'clock, huh? Till when? It must have been nearly two. It was a little after when I got home. Where were you? I met Steve at a bar over in Vermont. What's the name of it? Black Pony. What'd you do then? We had a couple of drinks, bite to eat. All right, go ahead. Some other guys came in, friends of Steve's. I met him once or twice, too. Mm-hmm. Somebody said, let's get up a poker game. I told him I couldn't afford it. I didn't have any cash to spare. And Steve said for me not to worry that if I ran short, he'd stake me. Yeah. And we all went over to his place. I did real good for the first couple of hours. I only had five bucks to start with and ran it up to over a hundred. Is that right? They were all ridding me. About how I was the one that didn't want to play. Yeah. Well, along about midnight, my luck started turning. By one thirty, I was cleaned up. Always seemed to be second high. Mm-hmm. Get a straight, sure as fate, somebody else would have a flush second high. The game break up at one thirty. Well, they played on a little longer without me, 15, 20 minutes. I stayed on because I wanted to make a touch from Steve after the other guys went home. All right, go ahead, I didn't know how to bring up the subject. Not that Steve can't afford it. He's got plenty of dough, and he won over a couple of hundred in the game. Mm-hmm. I was kind of beating around the bush, and all of a sudden I noticed how drunk he was. He couldn't get his pants off. Mm-hmm. Just toppled over on the bed and went to sleep. He sure looked like he was asleep. Mm-hmm. Money was still laying there on the table where we'd been playing over 200 bucks. I only took 80. That ought to prove I ain't a thief. If I was, I'd have taken it all. What'd you do then? I went home. Did you stop off on the way? Well, I couldn't have. Ask Judy. She'll tell you. I was there by a little after two. Were you in the neighborhood of the tie factory last night? Not within a half a mile. What's that got to do with it, anyway? Where does this friend of yours live? Steve? That's right. A little street just off Western, Gramercy Place. You got a telephone? I guess so. You know the number? Not offhand. It must be in the book. I'll check it, Joe. Last name's McGill, huh? That's right. What the heck's going on here? You guys didn't even know about Steve. He didn't turn me in. Hmm. Well, who did? A lot of ties were stolen last night. Factory you used to work for. Ties? That's right. Well, you think I had something to do with it? Your ex-boss does. Well, he hasn't got any right to accuse me. He threatened to make trouble. Well, I may have sounded off when he fired me, but it was just talk. How could I make trouble for him? Somebody did. We were unable to contact the suspect's friend, Steve McGill, until the following morning. He confirmed the story Gilroy had told us and refused to press any charges against him. 
From McGill, we got the names of the other three men who had played cards the night the tie factory was broken into. They also confirmed Gilroy's alibi. Sunday, September 11th, 10.46 a.m., Morgan Gilroy was released. Frank and I went back to the office. Now we got nothing. That's right. You think his wife was telling the truth? Hmm? About him getting home at 2.15. We can't prove he didn't. No, I guess not. Well, it seems to be cooling off a little, doesn't it? Yeah. Probably would have been able to sleep last night, too. Yeah. That's my luck. Well, maybe you can grab a nap this afternoon. No, I don't feel right when I sleep in the daytime, Joe. Isn't good for a person, you know. Throws your system right out of whack. Mm. Except for my brother-in-law, Armin. He can sleep anytime, anyplace. No strain at all. Okay. Burglary Friday. Yes, sir. Uh-huh. Yeah, I've got it. Well, when did it happen? I see. Right. Bye. Men's clothing store out on Crenshaw. Owner came in this morning to do some work on the books. Uh-huh. Somebody jimmied the back door during the night. Sold a supply of suits, slacks, sport coats. Yeah. And a batch of hand-painted ties. Frank and I drove out to Nimbo's men's store on Crenshaw Boulevard. We talked to the owner, Carl Nimbo. He showed us how the store had been entered and gave us a description of the stolen merchandise. The thief had apparently followed the same M.O. that had been used in the Prosper Tie Company. We were unable to learn anything more about the suspect's identity. Several days later, a tie shop in Hollywood reported the loss of over 200 nip ties. The following night, a men's clothing store on Wilshire Boulevard was burglarized. Investigation indicated that all these crimes were the work of the same man or men. Burglars who were known to have used similar M.O.s were interrogated. No leads were developed. Monday, September 19th, 8.06 p.m. Frank and I were getting ready to go off duty. You want to stop by the house on your way home? No, I'm pretty tired. I think I'll hit the sack early. We could watch a little TV. It's supposed to be a good fight tonight. It's too late for that now, isn't it? Oh, yeah, I guess so. Oh, we could watch something else. You're not going to go to sleep at 8 o'clock, are you? No. Well, come on, then. I'll get it. All right. Gregory Smith. Who? Oh, yes, sir. Sure, I remember. Yes, sir. I see. What's that address? We'll meet you out in front. Right away, yes, sir. Guy owns that tie factory, George Prosper. Yeah. He's calling from a bar over on Normandy. Uh-huh. One of his stolen ties just walked in. We drove out to a small bar and grill on the corner of Normandy and Kingsley Drive. George Prosper was standing in front of the place when we pulled up. He walked over to us. Evening, Mr. Prosper. Uh, good evening. How are you? Pretty fair. You sure this is one of your ties now? Positive, positive. It was a special. Worked out the design myself. Let's see. There isn't another one like it anywhere. I see. Can you point them out to us? Mm-hmm. Nicey, through the window there, that corner booth. That one there, huh? Yeah, tall fella sitting alone. Okay, thanks. Yeah, uh, you want me to come in with you? No, sir, we'll take care of it. We might need you later on, though. Whatever you say, you know how to get in touch with me. Yes, sir. Good night. Good night. Good night, sir.
Well, it doesn't seem possible. It must have cost him more than three fifty. No, it didn't. Huh? But it will. Dick Trundle gave us a description of the man who had sold him the tie. He agreed to accompany us to the bar where they'd met. 10.17 p.m., Frank and I interviewed the bartender at the BTJ Cafe on Olympic Boulevard. He remembered the suspect and said he had been in several times during the past week. He couldn't tell us his name or address. We left the bar and canvassed the vicinity for the hotel where the suspect had taken Trundle. 10.58 p.m., Trundle identified the Mortensen Hotel as the suspect's residence. Frank and I went inside and talked to the clerk on duty. To the best of my knowledge, there's only one person staying here who fits that description. That's Mr. Lafferty. Mm-hmm. He's one of the nicest gentlemen you ever meet. He's in the clothing business. Mm. Is he around now? Uh, let me check his box. Yes, yes, he must be in his room. The key's not here. What room is that? Uh, it's 212. He's very careful, Mr. Lafferty. He always leaves his key at the desk whenever he goes out. All right, thanks. He's generous, too. Generous to a fault. You don't say. I sure. See this tie? He gave it to me. Is that right? Yeah, it's one of my favorites. Well, that's too bad. Hmm? You may have to give it back. Frank and I walked up to the second floor. Room 212 was at the end of the hall near the fire escape. The transom was open and we could see a light inside the room. Who is it? Come on, open up. Yes, sir. Just a minute. What can I do for you, Jack? Police officer, stand still. Oh, police. You're wasting your time. I don't believe in firearms. He's light, Joe. What did I tell you? All right, where's the stuff? I suppose you mean the items I stole? That's what we mean. I've already managed to dispose of a good deal of it. What's left is in the closet. The Not bureau. Uh, by the way, the burglar kit's under the bed. Thanks. Always believe in cooperating with the police. Things seem to work out better that way. Yeah. Although, frankly, I'm surprised you weren't here sooner. Is that so? Last week. That's when I was expecting you. Well, I'm sorry we were late. Now, looks like we've got everything we need, Joe. All right, let's go. You didn't overlook the tools. Don't worry. Last week, I, I was certain you'd be here then. Mm-hmm. Right after my second job. I've never been able to pull more than two before, uh, without being arrested, I mean. You don't say. It was four this time, you know. Yeah, we know. Four jobs. Well, that's a new record for me. Well, let's don't let it go to your head, huh? Oh, I don't take all the credit. If I'd ever worked Los Angeles before, you probably would have found me sooner. Mm-hmm. Uh, have to go somewhere else when I get out. Yeah. Maybe up north to Seattle. I never worked there. Mm-hmm. Might be able to pull five jobs before they catch me. Set myself a new record. Yeah, well, that's not likely. You'll see. Just wait till I get out. We won't be around that long. The story you've just heard is true. The names were changed to protect the innocent. On January 7th, trial was held in Department 98, Superior Court of the State of California, in and for the County of Los Angeles. Russell Herbert Lafferty was tried and convicted of burglary in the first degree, four counts. Because of his previous record, he was adjudged to be an habitual criminal and was sentenced to life imprisonment in the state penitentiary, San Quentin, California. Dragnet, the story of your police force in action is a presentation of the United States Armed Forces Radio Service.
about the world he goes around in. It's about the big music and the big trouble and the big plenty. So when they ask you, tell them this one's about the blues. Pete Kelly's blues. Kelly's Blues, starring Jack Webb, with story by Joe Eisinger and music by Dick Kepner. My name's Pete Kelly. I play cornet. You'll find us at 417 Cherry Street, Kansas City. It's a standard speakeasy. Before Prohibition, the building housed the cleaning and dyeing plant. It hasn't changed much. The vats came in handy. It's still tough to get a clear gin, but a lady likes the idea of a drink to match the color of her dress. The lease is owned by George Lupo. He's a fat, funded little guy who wouldn't harm a fly. There's no money in harming flies. We start every night about ten and play till the customers get that first frightening look at each other in the early light. Lupo's working on a scheme to push the dawn back for at least one more hour. I don't think he'll make it, but I wouldn't want to risk a buck against him. The last night, everything was routine until I saw her again. We were just winding up the third set when she came in, flanked with the same deadpan gunsel. She sat alone at the same table, ordered the same drink, smoked the same Egyptian deities, and gave me that same loving look. The gunsel, as usual, nibbled at his drink at the bar, and his eyes playing watchdog for the girl. This was the fifth night, four nights running, same girl, same gunsel, same routine. Sit for five solid hours, drink, smoke, and work me over with her eyes, reach down deep for a sigh, and leave with deadpan right behind her. Well, I didn't like it. I was beginning to taste salt on my tongue. We went into a finish, and the girl looked once at the gunsel. He nodded, left the bar, and started to the stand. All right. Nick, can you push it a little? It helps when we can hear the beat. All right, don't audition for me. Just do it, huh? Pete. Yeah, Red. That babe's here again. I know, I know. All right, what do we got up next? Working up ahead of steam, Pete. Well, she's beginning to make me feel like a wayside shrine. You. Who? You. Me? Yeah. Oh, you got a request? A number you'd like no, to... No, I got no request, but the lady, she's got a request. The lady? What's the matter? You don't see the lady? How come you don't see the lady when she's looking right at you? Oh, that lady, yeah, sure, I see the lady. Well, why do you make like you don't see the lady when all the time you know the lady's looking right at you? Look, friend, I'm only a poor underpaid employee in this trap. Now, my contract says I'm to play music to please the patrons. I'd be very happy to do anything the lady likes to please the lady. So, all right. So what does she want me to do? Well, she wants you to have a drink with her. Sure, that'd be an honor. But I'm afraid that Mr. Lupo, he's my boss, you know. George Lupo, the proprietor, he doesn't like his employees to mingle I with I would talk you. to Lupo. He'll like it. Yeah, you could probably make him love it. Come on. I'll be right back, Red. Use some nickel. Right, Petey. Vita, this is Mr. Kelly. Mr. Kelly, this is Vita Brand. Sit down, Mr. Kelly. Yeah, thanks. All right now, Vita. You happy? I'm getting happier by the minute. Sure, you you want me to go back to the bar? Sit here, it's more friendly. Hello, Pete. Hello, Miss Brand. Vita. Vita. You like my name? Sure, sure, it's beautiful. Vita. I only just got it last week. Well, take a little time to break it in, huh? Let me hear you say it. Vita. Yeah. I like the way you say it. Like you mean it. Yeah, I do. I never meant anything more in my life. That's because you're sincere. I knew you were sincere the first time I looked at you. Remember the first night I came in? Sat here and looked at you. Yeah, well, I'm pretty busy up there, you know. Ain't got to wink since that night. Well, maybe if you go home and put your mind to it, huh? No use, Pete. I tried. Nothing's any good. Nothing I can do is going to change it. Change what? The way I feel. Sick? Yeah. With what? With love. Oh, poor Vita. Yeah, well, beautiful girl like you, no trouble finding another man. I don't want another man. You don't want another man. I want you. That's what Vita wants, you. I love you, Pete. Yeah, sure. Well, that's the way it ought to be. Everybody love everybody else. It's a better world. Well, I got a number to do. <laughs> you. Hey, you shut up. The lady is trying to tell you how much she loves you, so pay attention. Yeah. First time I saw you, Pete, hit me like a dumb dumb bullet. Well, excuse me. I have to earn a buck. Frame it. It's the last one you'll have to earn. <clears throat> All right. Let's do one. What do you got up? Deal with me again. All right. Pete. Yeah, Red. That babe, I got the rumble on her from Lupo. Yeah. 
Ever hear of a citizen named Bacalini? The three for boy, three killings for the prostitute. All right, Red, funnel it down, huh? She belongs to Bacalini's loser, Petey, loser. Yeah, you told me what, now tell me how. Well, let's try one. Let's do it we meet again. All right, we'll make a slow intro out of the last eight. We'll go back to the top, Nick, you take the first four going in. Everybody got it? Yeah. All right. Let's try it. Come on, let's all play it, huh? All right, once more. Nervous, Petey? No, I'm not nervous. Now, come on, everybody, once more. Gunsel's heading this way again. Yeah, I know. What do we got up next? The rules, sweet little you and his dick you want to start. Right. Now, look, friend, I got a job You're to do. Come it. Let's go. Where? Now, you listen, Buster. This ain't a lollipop poking you in the gut. I can drop you and be out of here before you hit the floor. Yeah. Let's go. Well, we went outside. The Hispano out in front probably wasn't as long as it looked. We've got fairly short blocks in this part of town. Vita took the wheel. She banked low around the corner, pulled out of a half Immelman, gained a little altitude, and flew blind for downtown Kansas City. Vita glanced at me from the corners of charged eyes. It just glanced at me. I leaned my head back and closed my eyes. The Hispano whipped down Main Street, lost altitude as we gained the deserted financial district, made a perfect no-point landing at the side entrance of the Grundy Bank and Savings. Well, we went into the bank through the family entrance. One light was burning, and it hung low over the biggest dice table I ever saw in any bank. The stick man was busier than a flea on a fat lady. He called the plays and called the points, and not one of the 50 torpedoes glanced at us as we climbed a short flight to an upstairs office. Two men were in the room. One, a shadow dressed in dark clothes, looked through a small window onto the dice game down below. The Tommy gun rested easy across his knees. The other man sat behind a desk no bigger than the loading platform at Union Station. He was counting money. Neat, orderly piles of bills were stacked around him like a well-trimmed hedge. We waited while he finished thumbing a book of 50s. He just held him up to his ear, fanned him once, made a note on a pad by his elbow. Finally, he turned his swivel chair to face us. It was all chin and jaw. He leaned back, made a church steeple with his fingers, threw me a credit manager's smile, and rocked his chair gently to and fro. Well, come in, Mr. Kelly. Sit down. You're among friends. Yeah, thanks. Pete, permit me to introduce you to this here gentleman here who's very fond of you. Sure, everybody loves me tonight. Oh, he doesn't love you. <laughs> Only I love you. He's really very fond of you. I am back to ladies. Yeah. <laughs> he's confused. Ain't he cute? Ain't he cute when he's confused? What is your confusion? How much time do you have? I'm at your disposal. 
Well, now, look. It runs something like this, Mr. Bacchalides. I play cornet, see? At 417, I mind my own business. I try not to poke a thumb in anybody's eye. Well, I noticed this young lady here sitting out front, and tonight she asked me to have a drink with her. Well, naturally, I'm flattered. Yes, by, yes, know... I know all this, but what is your confusion? Well, it seems that this young lady here has a... Well, some kind of an idea that she sort of likes me and... Loves you, Mr. Kelly. Yeah, well, loves me, like you say. Well, I don't figure myself for no Rudolph Valentino, so I get an idea that it's a rib, you know, and especially since I know how... Well, how she... How both of you... Not both. One. Me, I love Vita very much. Oh, darling, you're sweet. Yeah, that's right, for a fact. And when Vita thinks it over, I'm sure she's There's nothing over. more to think over, Mr. Kelly. Vita has stopped loving me. All right, I face it. It makes me very unhappy, but I face it. Now, she loves you. She wants you. I know how unhappy this can make her. I do not like for Vita to be unhappy, so Vita and me, we talk it over. We decide you will marry Vita. Thank you, darling, you're sweet. There's nothing, Vita. You know how I will do anything to make you happy, anything. All right, now how about doing something to make me a little happy, huh? But I give you Vita. Yeah, well, I pass. You refuse? Oh, Pete, you don't mean that. You have made Vita cry. I do not like to see Vita <laughs> cry. Tell her you do not mean that. Goodbye, friend. I got a number to do at 417, and it ain't here comes the bride. It's... Yeah. Pick him up. On your feet. You will ask Vita to be your wife. What's the next best offer? Pitch, don't hurt him. I won't. <laughs> All right, Itch. I think Mr. Kelly wants to say something. Yeah. Kelly. Huh? Who am I? Huh? You hear me? Yeah, I hear you. Whiskey. Right. Put him in that chair. Come on, boy. Hold his head back. Yeah. All right, he is fine now. Yeah. All I need is a few kind words. I will give them to you. Just repeat after me. Vida, I love you. Vida, I love you. Mean it. Vida, I love you. Oh, Pete. Will you marry me? Will you marry me? Oh, darling, of course I will. Congratulations. We drink to it. To the happy bride and groom. Long life. Long life. Long life. Yeah. Now, here's how. Tomorrow afternoon, you and Vida will marry in City Hall. It will be best man. Then you go on a nice long honeymoon and drive to Canada in my Hispano, which I give Vita for a wedding present. Look, I got a job here in town, 417 Cherry. Go back to that crib. Tell the boss you quit. Tear up your cornet. I'm loaded, Pete. Loaded. All right. Here's a pound of fifties. Tomorrow morning, you buy some clean clothes, top to bottom, inside and out. You will meet Vita at City Hall, 2 o'clock. Here's a key to the Hispano. Take it. Now kiss Vita goodnight. Yeah. Good night, Angel. I'll be the happiest bride in the world. Sure. And you'll be the happiest bridegroom. Yeah, for the saddest step. Well, I left the office inside the spin of a top. The Hispano stood by the curb, sleek and calm, just like nothing had happened. Nothing at all. Well, I pointed for the 12th Street Bridge, made the other side of the river, and set a course down Boulder Road for Fat Annie's place. Oh, I tried to imagine life with Vita Brand. And then I thought of six painless ways of committing suicide. And I began to feel better. Fat Annie's place was doing a fair business for the lull hours. Maggie Jackson was standing back to the piano. I groped my way to the bar, ordered a bromo and ammonia, and listened. All right. For the wealthy gentleman from Detroit. He needs me. All right, Ray. Congratulations. What's for? Let's get back here. I want you to be the first to know. In here. Pete, who 
what's the over? You ever hear of a nail named Vita Brand? Vita? Why, she don't weigh hardly enough to beat the white of an egg. What do you know about her, Maggie? Nothing much for sure. Only she's back in Lady's package, and that makes her a package nobody tampers with. Nobody. Yeah, nobody but me. Not if you love life, you don't. I gotta. Who says? Back of Lady's says. Petey, you all right? Till tomorrow, two o'clock, yeah. What's then? Men's the wedding. Who? Mine, and Vita Brand. Petey, you've gone simple for sure. You know what Back of Lady's will do to you? Look, Maggie, I just left Back of Lady's and Vita. He catch you with her? Look, that way I'm healthy. If he catches me without her, I'm dead in my socks. Petey, you're taking those risks too fast. Slow it down a little. Back of Lady, he's just crazy about that woman. Remember Albino Artie? He once looked at Vita like Bacalitis didn't buy. That was six or seven weeks ago. You seen Albino Artie for the past six or seven weeks? No, nobody has. Well, hear this. Bacalitis orders me to marry Vita at two o'clock tomorrow afternoon. Now square it for me. Why? And Vita, what does she say about this? Only that she loves me. She tell that to Bacalitis? Right to his platinum teeth. Mm. I'm getting that feeling, Petey. Like my grandmother used to get. And what's it tell you? That Vita's preparing herself to be a bride and a widow both in the same day. Yeah. Well, I better move. You do that, Pete. Fast and far. So long, Maggie. I will. And if I were you, I wouldn't stop moving till I heard him speak in foreign languages. Well, marry Vita and I'm a dead bridegroom. Don't marry Vita, I'm a dead bachelor. Well, I decided to try to be a live fugitive. I raced the Hispano back across the river, pulled up sharp in front of 417 Cherry. The brakes never made a sound. Lupo was pounding the cash register with both fists. He threw the usual glare at me as I pushed through to the bandstand. Hold it down, huh? hold it down. Let's do this one real fine for me. It's my last time around. See? Yeah, Red. You being pushed out? Yeah, it's that or carried out. All right. Let's do singing the blues, huh? Everybody ready? Yeah. All right, here we go. business I got to take care of. Well, you'll hear from me, so just keep at it right here until... Red? Yeah, see? In the alley, huh? Uh-huh. Look, Red, I'm in a jam. What can I do to help you? Thanks, but nothing. I got to keep moving. Maybe cool off in a couple of weeks. Maybe not. Meantime, try to keep the boys together, huh? Sure. Well... Need a couple of bucks, Erskine? Anything? No, I'm fine. I'll see you. Well, it wasn't easy. I was going to...
to miss the boys. I missed Red already. No, it wasn't easy. But there was only one exit. I drove around to the rooming house, raced up the stairs. All I had to take was a clean shirt, my other suit, and my book of arrangements. I'd hightail it east, just keep rolling till I ran out of road. That was the plan, until I got to my room. She was stretched across my bed, and she looked right at me as I came in. And there she was, on my bed, looking right at me, but I was all alone. Now Vita would never be anybody's widow. She was too dead to say I do. The stocking from her left leg was where no girl's stocking ought to be, knotted tightly around her throat. Well, I tiptoed back to the door, as though she was a light sleeper. I closed the door very gently behind me, and then I raced down the three flights into the street, into the Hispano, and into high speed. There was no lambing out of this one. You just don't hit the road in a car belonging to the stiff you leave behind. For such violations, the law is strict. Also, back of ladies. Well, I pulled up hard in front of Sour Sammy's joint. This time, the brakes cried. Barney Ricketts was sitting at his usual table in his usual state, boiled and loud. Barney's the only ex-bootlegger in the country who went broke in 1922. He says he did that to aggravate a couple of prohibition agents he hated. Well, Barney saw me come in and waved me over to his table. Ah, Pete Kelly. Welcome, Petey, and have a drink. Look, Barney, I'm up to my eyes. Nonsense, Petey. You haven't even opened them yet. Ah, here we are. A drink for you and a drink for me. Now, listen, Barney, I'm in trouble. Petey, I have suddenly become oppressed by the state of the world. Well, it's my own fault, Petey, my own fault. I make it a rule never to look at the public prints. But tonight, well, uh, just listen to these few choice items. Now, look, Barney, right now I'm a moving target for Bacalini's gun. Last night's edition of the Star. Look here, Petey, September 8, 1923. Girl forced to leap from stranger's automobile. But let us remember, Petey, that the only girls who leap from stranger's automobiles are those who climb into them. And here, uh, look here. All right, Barney. California politicians say they are responsible for President Calvin Coolidge's success. Probably insist, Petey, that it's in honor of their state that he's called Cal. And this, Petey... Barney, look, there's a dead girl in German my room. Mark quoted at 28 cents per million. So you see, Petey, even a German millionaire is supposed hard to feel like 30 cents. Now look, Vita Brand, back a lady's girl, she's dead, Barney, in my room. Well, now, that's most careless of you, Petey. If I run, it's the law, Barney. If I stand still, it's back a lady's. How did you get mixed up with Vita Brand and Bacalidi? I don't know. I'm still in last week's fog. She wanted to marry me. Bacalidi said I would or else. Why, Barney? Why, if he taught for? Very simple problem in human relationships, Petey. Tonight, the word got out that Muggsy Brand was sprung. Who's Muggsy Brand? Peter's father. He was sent up last year. Peter's his whole life. He tried to guard her like Lupo guards his cash register. He hates Bacalidi's, and if he learned that he and Peter... Yeah, yeah, now it's coming into focus. Sometimes, Petey, you're dull-witted. Dull-witted, but stupid. So Bacalidi... Ladies and Vita rig it to disarm her old man. She marries me, takes the heat off back a little. Splendid, Vita, splendid. And her old man winds up throwing the knife at me. All I gotta do now is explain Vita's body in my room to Muggsy Brand. Precisely what back ladies expects you to face. All right. Do the rest of it together for me, will you? Back ladies is married. He could never square himself with Vita. He got in deeper than he wanted to. Mm. He couldn't jump her because of Muggsy coming out. So he ties her onto you, gets her up to your room, leaves her dead on your bed. How do I back out of this one, Barney? Do you know where to reach Bacalides? Yeah, at the Grundy Bank. He's dice game? Yeah, that's right. All right, go there. See Bacalides? Lay it on the line for him. All the way, just like we talked in here. Well, he'll cut me down. He might. How much edge do I have? Not quite enough to shave with. But maybe just enough to cut my throat, huh? It's your only chance, Pete. You're in the middle of a three-way push. The law, Bacalides, Muggsy Brand. All right, Barney. I'm counting on you on the outside. Don't worry, Petey. I'll be there with bells on. Yeah, make sure they don't toll for me. <laughs> Well, I went back to the Grundy Bank in savings. I had no trouble getting in. The game was just heating up. I stalled around the dark edges of the table for a minute and laid a few bucks on the field. Upstairs, the light was on in the office. The boy with the big piece was still sitting at the window. I could see the head and shoulders of Bacalides. He was still counting money. I started slowly up the stairs, went into the room without knocking. The muscle man swung sharp, pointing the heater at my stomach. Bacalides, fast for a big man, flung out a hand and knocked the gun out of line. Hold it! Next time, knock, or you pick up a lot of weight. Yeah, or a silk stocking around my neck? No, for you, a knife. From the fingers of the best shiv man in the country. Muggsy Brand? Don't try to run, Kelly. He likes a moving target. Just go to him. Tell him his daughter is in your bed, a stocking around her throat. Tell him you don't understand any of it. He will be very sympathetic. Well, that's nice, Mr. Bacalides. You set it up real nice. <laughs> Smart, huh? Sure. You persuade Vita to buzz it around that I'm number one. Everything's fixed for her father's ears. Even get her to help you push her across by going up to my room. You tell a good story, friend. Maybe too good. I'll put that rod down, Bacalides, before you drop it and break your toe. Maxie, take him downstairs. Come back alone. Petey, look out. Get down. Mumsy. Barney, you all right? Shell shock. Mm. Mm. Muggsy Brand? 
Yes, Pete. I knew where he was. All he heard was Bacalides. Kelly. Yeah, Muggsy. Bacalides. I got him? He was between the guns. Not much left of him. Or his trigger man. Or me. Now listen. He might poke. Money. Take it. He might kill a good burial. Easy, Muggsy, huh? She was only a kid. Maybe if she met a guy like... He's gone, Pete. Yeah. What do you mean, Pete? A guy like who? Who knows, Barney? Who knows? Transcribed. It's the Silver Jubilee on NBC. There's another thrilling adventure in store for you tonight with Les Damon as the hard-hitting adventurer known as the Falcon. Later, hear the best in music, the tunes which America is singing. Yes, we bring you a sparkling new program devoted to the best in popular music and presided over by well-known musical director Meredith Wilson. Tonight, make a listening reminder to hear Meredith Wilson's music room. Les Damon as the Falcon, tonight on NBC. Sergeant, you're assigned to auto theft detail. The recovery rate of stolen automobiles in your city has dropped far below normal. Evidence points to an organized gang of car thieves. Your job, break it up. It was Tuesday, June 14th. It was hot in Los Angeles. We were working the day watch out of auto theft detail. My partner's Frank Smith. The boss is Captain Nelson. My name's Friday. We are on our way out from the office, and it was 11.27 a.m. when we got to 2564 Dewey Avenue. Apartment 3G. Want to try it again? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, hi, Joe, Frank. Hi, Whitey. Hi. Good morning. Thanks. Come on out in the kitchen. I'm washing out some socks. You don't care if I finish up, do you? No, go ahead. I got up this morning. I figured I'd better get it done. I haven't got a clean pair to my name. Mm-hmm. Drag a chair and sit down. Thank you. What do you want to see me about? A couple questions. I'm not in the fire, am I? Not with us. Uh-uh. I couldn't remember anything. You never know. No. What is it? You still working at that garage? Night shift. Check in at four. This got something to do with my job? Might have, yeah. Look, fellas, you know the history. I'm not going to try and hand you a lot of slush, but I'm clean. Half a dozen guys will tell you that. I haven't got off the line since the last time I was tagged. Well, you're in no trouble, Whitey. We figured maybe you could give us a hand. <laughs> Here's the switch. Hmm? Me giving you some help. Usually works the other way. Uh, what are you looking for? A lot of cars going someplace, Whitey. We're trying to find out where and who's driving them. Thought maybe you might have heard a rumble. Mm, there's always something going around. You got anything? Won't do me any good if it goes outside. We won't open the door. There's supposed to be three of them. What do you know about them? Two men and a woman. Two fellas are supposed to be pretty heavy. Any names? No, they're playing it pretty close. Even the rumble's not solid. Mm-hmm. A couple of days ago, I talked to a guy down at the garage... He was telling me about the operation, said it was big. He know the people? Enough to be in the same bar. Told me he tried to get a piece of the action, but they're not cutting any of it. Can we talk to this guy? I can't stop you, but I can't give you a hand either. What do you mean? I can't tell you where to find him. Does he come around the garage much? No, he comes in once in a while, talks, nothing regular. What's he do for a living? Drives. Hmm? Stock car races. Oh, gee. Has he got a name? Call him Tops. I don't know the right. You know what he's talking about? I think so. He likes to yak, but he sounded straight on this. To give you any details on the operation? I didn't ask a lot. I figure the less I know about deals like this, the less I can get in trouble. Yeah. Look at that. Huh? Well, that sock is worn. Argyle, good ones. Cost me five bucks. 
Look at that hole in the heel, right in the middle of the two colors. How do you mend a sock like that? What do you mean? Well, how do you sew it up? Use one color and it louses up the argyle part. Use the color of the argyle and it'll go into the foot part. Sock people ought to figure some way around. Yeah. Might as well throw them away. Any word on what they're doing with the cars? I didn't hear it. They turn it up? No, not where we can find them. Smart. Are they local people, Wayne? I don't know. I don't think so. I can't tell you why. I just don't think they're from L.A. Mm Mm-hmm. They scoring pretty good? Yeah, they are. Last two weeks, we figured they've taken a half a dozen cars. Well, how do you lay it on them? Well, the way they're working, the M.O. points to the same gang. What's the pattern? Cars are taken in the early morning hours from in front of the owner's house. Jumper wire? Yeah, all eight models. They won't touch anything that isn't fully equipped. Any special make? No. As long as the car's a radio and a heater, white sidewalls, they want it. They're not turning up, huh? No. Maybe they're getting them out of the country. No, that doesn't figure. We've had the border check. San Diego's working on it. Two of the jobs, we had the broadcast out within a half hour after the car was taken. We couldn't turn anything. It just seemed to disappear. You must have a big parking lot. Yeah. You he said the two men were heavy. That's right. Well, how'd you come up with that? Well, the guy who told me the story, you know, Tops? Yeah. When he laid the rumble out, he said he talked with one of the fellas at a bar. Mm-hmm. Told the guy he'd like a piece of the action. About that time, the roof fell in. What do you mean? Well, the guy got real rough. Said there wasn't going to be any split. The action was going to stay in the same corner. Mm-hmm. Showed Tops a gun. Said if anything about the operation got out, he'd use it. The way Tops put it, he wasn't kidding. Did you get any kind of a description of the man? No. Does Tops fellas tell you where the bar was? Huh. Well, okay, Whitey. If you hear from him again, will you let us know? Uh, sure. Call you at the office? That's right. Wish I could have given you more. I'll nose around, see if I can pick up anything. We appreciate that. Don't go out in the limo. You don't have to worry about that. I'm not going to line myself up for any trouble I don't need. Mm-hmm. Well, we'll check you later then, huh? Yeah. Hope I'll have something for you in the next couple of days. Well, if you do, it'll put you way ahead. Hmm? We've been on it two weeks. Yeah? We haven't got a place to start. On Saturday, May 27th, the first theft had been reported. The victim said he parked his car in front of his house and returned an hour later to find it gone. An immediate local and APB had been gotten out, but the vehicle wasn't found. Three days later, on May 30th, there was another theft. Same M.O. In spite of all our precautions, the thefts continued. To date, seven automobiles had been taken and none of them had been recovered. All possible sources of information had been checked out without result. Outlets for stolen cars had been kept under 24-hour surveillance without netting any new information. The staff's office had made runs on each theft and on the general M.O. When the list they returned to us was checked, we were no closer to the thieves. Pressure from the victims and their insurance companies began to build, but there apparently wasn't anything we could do to stop the operation. Frank and I went back to the office and ran the name and description of the man known as Tops through the moniker file. There was no record of such a person. Two more days passed. Another car was stolen. People in the immediate vicinity were questioned, but none of them had seen the thief. Saturday, June 18th, 11.40 a.m. Okay. Out of there, Smith. Yeah? Oh, yeah. Can you hold him? Right. Be right there. Yeah. It's Coach. Hmm? That was quiet. He called us from the garage. What's he got? That fellow Tops. Yeah. He just walked in. Frank and I left the city hall and drove over to the garage where our informant worked. He pointed out an elderly man in the rear of the place. We identified ourselves and asked him to step into the office. What do you want to see me about? It's a couple of questions. Well, I ain't done nothing. No reason for you to rouse me around. You're not being roused. Well, sure looks like it from here. You want to sit down? I'd rather stand up. It's all the same to you. All right, suit yourself. You want a cigarette? Yeah. Right? Yeah, thanks. I got a light. Right. What's your real name, Tops? Henry Grayson. What do you do for a living? I can get a car, I race. Stock car? Yeah. Where? Around well, different tracks. You live here in L.A.? Most of the time. Come back when I'm not working. You got a job now? No, I'll figure to go back east next week. Think I can line something up. Hey, look, you maybe got a lot of time to kill. I haven't. Why don't you tell me what this is all about so I can get out of here? You have been arrested? Huh? You have been in jail? Yeah. What charge? Well, they didn't make it stick. Well, what were you arrested for? Rent theft. Auto or money? Auto. Do any time? I told you, they didn't make it stick. Where'd this happen? Idaho. That's your only arrest, huh? Well, a couple of times for a bag. They hold you? No, give me a floater. Mm-hmm. Come on, come on, you guys are after something. What is it? You know anything about a gang of car thieves that have been working here in town? What? Stolen cars. Oh, why should I have anything on it? We heard you did. From where? We heard it. Is it true? Lousy way. He told you, didn't he? It's not important where we got the information. We're trying to find out if it's true. Then you'll have to look someplace else. I got nothing for you. 
Where'd you get the nickname Tots? Huh? It's a funny name. How'd you get it? When I was a kid, I had real blonde hair, almost white. Other kids call me Cotton Top, shortened it down. Mm-hmm. You like driving for a living? It's all right. Better than working. You do pretty good at it. Hmm? Is there any money in driving? Well, it depends. Sometimes a good month and a couple of bad ones. Depends. How do you do? I'm not starving. Mm-hmm. Well, what do you want to know about the stolen cars? What can you tell us? Not much. We'll take what you got. I got to talking with a guy one night. The subject come up, we kicked it around. It turned out he had a deal going for him. Friend of yours? Never saw him before. All right, go ahead. Well, that's it. He had this deal working. I don't know anymore. Why don't you do yourself a favor? Why? If you're not mixed up in this thing, why are you holding out? I'm not. I'm giving you what I know. Maybe it isn't a guy's life story, but it's all I got. All right. From the beginning. Tell us, will you? What? Everything this fella said. You got nothing to hold me on. As far as I'm concerned, it's okay if you do pull me in. A couple of days on the city, give me rent and food bills. All right, let's go. Look, if I had any information, I'd give it to you. No reason for me to hold out. That's right. I never saw the guy before. I haven't laid eyes on him since. Then what do you stand in front of him for? What? Makes you look like the passy for the piece. Anybody takes a beef, it's going to be you. For what? Sitting in a bar and listening to some drunk? It's more than that, and you know it. I can't tell you. Why? These guys too heavy for you, are they? Is that why you won't go along with us? You're scared? If you got to tie it down, that's the reason. They won't get near you. You can guarantee it? We can. Okay, I'll go. What do you want to know? The whole story, now. There was much to tell. It was in this bar one night. Two fellas come in. They were both kind of gassed. Mm-hmm. Sat down next to me and started to talk. To you? No, but they were right next to me. I could hear what they were saying. All right, go on. Well, they were talking about this deal. I was all set up. First off, I didn't know what it was all about. Then I heard one of them mention something about cars. Yeah. Well, it's like saying something about a new kind of camera around a photographer. As soon as I heard the word cars, I started to listen. Good. Mm-hmm. They were having a beef about something. One of them wanted to start unloading right away. The other guy said they should wait for a while. Dump them all at once. Yeah. Well, they stood there and talked like that for a while, and one of them noticed me listening. Go ahead. He leaned over and said something to the other guy, and the next thing I knew, I was surrounded. One of them on each side, leaning on me. Mm-hmm. Didn't want any trouble. I could see those two guys had a pocket full of it, so I went along with them. Well, what happened? Well, they asked me if I liked what I heard. Yeah. I told them I didn't hear anything. Said I had very bad ears. Mm-hmm. They didn't believe it, said they wanted to talk me outside the bar. Yeah. Well, I figured if they got me out there, I'd end up with something broken, so I didn't go. Tried to push me around, but the bartender came over, and they moved away. What happened then? Came back. Told me if I said anything to anybody but what they were saying, they'd get me. One of them had a gun. He kind of pulled his coat back. I could see it in his belt. Mm-hmm. They weren't kidding. Word that I talk to you gets back from him. I'm as good as dead. Well, don't worry about it. Did you try and cut yourself in on the deal? No. We heard you did. Well, it's not true. I told Whitey that, but it never happened. Well, why'd you tell him it did? Well, I don't know. I'm trying to be a big man, I guess. Yeah. These two fellows hang around the bar? Huh? Have you seen the two men around the bar before? No. It's the first time. Any of the other people in the place seem to know them? Mm-hmm. They leave the place before you did? Yeah, finished up their drinks and walked out. They have a car? If they did, I didn't see it. I stayed where I was. Figured maybe they were waiting for me. Didn't leave the place until just before two. You think you'd know him again if you saw him? Yeah, I'm sure of it. Well, we'd like you to come downtown and look for some pictures. Well, I don't like to be a finger. Well, you haven't got much choice, fella. I suppose not. All right, let's go. Now, don't forget, you guys said you'd take care of me. We will. Those fellas find out I'm on your side, they'll try to kill me. Nothing's going to stop them. Yeah, we think there is. What? Us. We took Henry Grayson back to the city hall and had him check the mug books. He was unable to identify the suspects. We ran his name through the record section and found that he had no arrests in the state of California. At his own request, he was returned to his home. Local broadcasts and APBs were put out carrying the description of the two male suspects. A week passed without result. Monday, June 27th. I got it. Auto theft Friday. Yes, sir. That's right. Well, when was that? No, we can't take one over the phone. No, well, I'm sorry, too. That's right. You live in Hollywood? I see. Well, now, if you'll go down to the police station on Wilcox Avenue. That's right. In Hollywood. They'll take it for you. 1358 between Sunset and Santa Monica. That's right. You betcha. Bye. Car theft? Bicycle. Fellow says his kid left it in front of the house, came back, and it was gone. Hmm. That's what something we can do for you? I'd like to talk to somebody about a stolen car. Well, sit down. We'll take the information. Yes, sir. Thank you. All right, sir. What can we do for you? You're a policeman? That's right. It's Frank Smith. My name's Friday. How do you do? I'm Joe Pennant. All right. All right, sir. What do you want to see us about? 
I think I bought a stolen car. Why do you think it's stolen? Well, just the way it was handled. Whole thing's got something funny about it. Where's the car now? I got it parked outside in the other street over there. Mm-hmm. You have a license number? Yeah, I have. You want it? Yes, sir. We can check it for you. I got it written down here. I'll... All the information someplace. Pink slip, too. Oh, yeah, here it is. Very kind, thank you. I'll check it, Joe. Okay, thanks. I sure hate to put you in all this trouble. That's all right. I feel silly if it turns out okay. Well, why do you think the car is stolen? Well, I own this little place up near Lancaster. It's kind of a bar and a couple of cabins for tourists. Mm-hmm. We're out of town a ways. We don't do a lot of business, enough to make a pretty good living, but it's all hard work. Yeah. Uh, day before yesterday, that was Saturday, uh-huh. this guy came into the place, had something to eat. We got to talk. You know, nothing important. Yeah. He told me he's on his way back east to find a job. Talked about how he's having a lot of trouble, lost his job and all. Mm-hmm. Well, he had this new car parked right outside, said he just bought it. Asked me if I knew anybody who'd buy it. You mean he wanted to sell the car? Yeah, I said he just got it and he needed the money to get wherever he was going. Told me he paid cash for it and he wanted to get some money out of it. Yeah. He said he didn't want to take a loss, but he didn't have the price of gas for it. Mm-hmm. So he wanted to sell it. All right, go ahead. I asked him how much he wanted, quoted a figure, a couple hundred dollars under wholesale. It seemed like a good deal, so I bought it. Yeah. Then other guys come in and want to sell things. I learned the hard way, so I asked him if he could prove he really owned the car, that he didn't steal it. Yeah. I didn't say it like that, you understand. If the deal was honest, I didn't want to scare him off. Yeah. And he showed me the pink slip and told me where he bought the car. It's a place called Brompton Auto Service in Hollywood. Did you contact them? Yeah, I put a call right through. What'd they say? Well, I went through a big trash about it. I talked to a couple of secretaries before I got to the sales manager. He checked the records. He said the car had been purchased from them. He gave me the man's name and everything. Mm-hmm. Nothing about the deal then to make me think there was anything wrong. Pink slip, the car people. Yeah. I bought it. Gave the man a check. We drove into town. I dropped him off at the bus terminal. He said he'd cash the check on Monday. That's today. Yeah. Happened I had to come into town this morning, checked at the bank, and they told me that the check had cleared. That it was cash first thing. They opened the doors. I got worried about it and decided I'd better talk to you. Yeah. How about it? Well, stolen, all right. I had a feeling. Anything on it? No, I checked the report. Well, it's the bunch we're after. While the victim, Joel Pennant, looked through the mug books, Frank and I went over to the bank and picked up the check the suspect had cashed. The name on the pink slip had been run through R&I, but there was no record on it. The check was handed over to Larry Sloan in handwriting. The pink slip was sent to the crime lab where it was found to be a forgery. We checked the phone book for a listing on the Brompton Auto Service, but we found none. The victim had made a note of the phone number, and from it we were able to obtain the address where the telephone was installed. It was a large office building on 7th Street. Frank and I went over to see the superintendent. Yeah, this is where they were at 926. When did they move out? Oh, sometime over the weekend. I'm not sure of the day. I'm off on Saturday and Sunday. I see. We'll hardly ever come down to the building on my day off. Yes, sir. How long were they in the office? Oh, a couple of weeks. Said they wanted a place for a month. They paid for it in advance. They told me if things worked out, they'd take a lease. Yeah. Guess things didn't work out. Did they leave any forwarding address? No, they didn't. What can you tell us about them? Not much. I only talked to them a couple of times. Seemed nice enough. Did they tell you what kind of business they were in? No, said they were trying to get a new product started. Told me... Most of their work would be over the phone. Did they pay for the office by check or cash, you know? Cash. So they didn't have their checks printed up yet. They use a name of any kind? Uh, I don't think I understand you. Did they call each other by name? Yeah, they did when they were looking over the office. Do you remember them? Let me think a minute. Well, it comes to me, one of them was called Tom. The other one was named uh, Ralph. No last name? No, I didn't hear them. Mm-hmm. What about the woman? I called her Lerner. Remember that when they introduced her. Nicky Lerner. Uh-huh. Has the office been cleaned since they left? No, it hasn't. All right, sir. We'd like to have some men from our office go over the place. Sure. Glad to help any way I can. Fine, thank you. Can you come downtown and look at some pictures for us? The criminals? Well, of some possible suspects. See if I can pick them out, huh? That's right. You better will. Wait here, I'll get my coat. Go right with you. All right, fine. Well, second thought, uh, you better wait in the lobby. We can go right out the door. It'll be faster. I'll be fine. Well, let's go. Yeah, I can't hardly wait to get home and tell my wife what's happened. Uh-huh. She's all the time after me because I never have nothing interesting to tell her at night. Yes, sir. It's going to be different this time. Give her a story. It'll really make her mouth hang open. Sure going to be a doozer. Yeah. You guys could do me a favor, though. What's that? Could you drive me home after I look at the pictures? We'll see that you get there. Yes, sir. I'd like it to be in a black and white car, if you can swing it. All right. Make the story more exciting. You know, hard-hitting. Yeah. Something else if I come home in a black and white police car. What's that? My wife will believe me.
took the superintendent down to the city hall, but he failed to identify the suspects. The crime lab crew went over the office they had used, but they were unable to find any useful information. Another week passed. During that time, we had reports that four of the stolen cars had been sold. The circumstances in each case were the same. In each instance, we checked out the address the suspects had used as a front without result. Tuesday, July 5th, Frank and I walked into the squad room. Well, it's not the same, Joe. Hmm? It's not the same at all. It's all changed. It has. Sure. Don't make any difference how you try. It just doesn't come off. What are you talking about? The fourth, Joe. The fourth. The fourth, huh? Yeah. Remember how when we were kids, they had firecrackers and the torpedo things you threw against buildings, stuff like that? Yeah. No more. All they got now is sparklers. Sparklers and them fountain things. Is that so? Yeah. Well, they're nice. They look pretty, but it's not the same. Mm-hmm. I remember getting up on the morning of the 4th, you see who the first kid in the block was to get a can in the air. Real contest, like. What? Get a can in the air. You know, put a firecracker under a can, light it off. Real contest in our block, so you could be the first one in the morning of the 4th. Didn't you ever do that? Yeah. Well, we sure did. Never forget it. Well, it's not the same now. Yeah, but it's a lot safer now, isn't it? I got it. All up there, Friday. That sure might be. That's worth checking anyway. Right. We'll be right over. It's Mott over in Forgery. Yeah? Just picked up a printer. Been cashed the checks. Uh-huh. Checked his plant. Found something we might be able to use. What? 65 pink slips. We went over to room 29 and met with Sergeant Hal Mott. He told us that he and his partner had picked up a suspect on suspicion of forgery. When they searched the man's home, they found a printing plant where the suspect had been making up phony checks. They'd also found master plates for automobile pink slips and a quantity of the slips themselves. Under questioning, the suspect admitted the forgeries but denied any knowledge of the automobile registrations. Frank and I took him to the interrogation room. Your true name is Harry Larwell, is that right? Yeah. You want to tell us about those pink slips? I don't know anything about them. You printed them, didn't you? I guess so. Well, and don't you know? I printed them. What were you going to do with them? I did it for kicks, nothing more. For practice. Yeah. Do you think a story like that's going to stand up in court? Look, I copped out to the forgery rap. Isn't that enough for you guys? We want to know about those pinks. I already told you. How many counts did they get on you? I don't know, 10 or 12. Well, then you know you're not going to do that stand on your head. Hmm? You'll stand 1 to 14 on each count. It's a lot of time if they run consecutively. Now, come on. Why'd you print the slips? What happens to me if I tell you? What do you mean by that? We'll make it an easier on me? We don't decide that. Well, you see, the judge knows, huh? We'll put it down like that, yeah. Now, tell us about it, will you? I made them up for Tom and Ralph. Who are they? A couple guys I know. They come to me with this deal, said if I'd make them 100 slips, they'd give me 1,000 bucks. I needed the money, so I did the job. Yeah. Well, after I made them, Ralph said they could only use 45 of them, then we had a beef. He gave me 500, and I gave him the pinks. You know where you can pick up your friends? Yeah. Pipe it out in Hollywood. The girl there, too. Who do you mean? Understand her name's Nikki. Oh, yeah, yeah. Ralph's wife. Yeah, I guess she should be around. When'd you see him last? Yesterday. Ralph called me in the morning, told me they was interested in the rest of the slips. Wanted to know if we could make a deal. What'd you tell him? Yeah, we could. I'm supposed to meet him this afternoon. Where? Drugstore in Sunset. He told me three of them were going to leave town. All right. You going to pick them up? That's right. Guess they had a good thing going for him. Sure, we're raking in the dough. Yeah. Uh, Ralph told me about it, said they were coining money. I kind of hate to see it broken up. You do? Yeah. Good deal like that. Good ones are hard to come by these days. Takes a lot of time to set one up. Mm Mm-hmm. Break this one up, they'll have to sit down and figure another way to make a buck. Kind of hurts to think about it. It does. Yeah. Yeah. Good deal like that shot. It really hurts me. Think what it's going to do to them. The story you've just heard is true. The names were changed to protect the innocent. On November 10th, trial was held in Department 89, Superior Court of the State of California, in and for the County of Los Angeles. Ralph Norwood Prescott, Thomas Dean Bolton, and Nikki Lerner Prescott were tried and convicted of grand theft auto five counts and received punishment as prescribed by law. Grand theft auto is punishable by imprisonment for a period of from one to ten years in the state penitentiary. Ladies and gentlemen, careless driving is kid stuff. Most automobile accidents happen when we forget to act our age and drive carefully. Letting off steam, 
defying authority, showing off, risks a driver's life as well as the lives of other people. In your car, act your age. The life you save may be your own. of the United States Armed Forces Radio Service. expenses from a detective bureau run by a guy named Anthony J. Lyon. They call me the Lion's Eye. Jack Webb is Jeff Regan investigator as CBS offers you hard-boiled action and mystery and thrilling adventure in tonight's story of The Lady with Too Much Hair. Suite 308 in the Cosmopolitan Building on 7th near Olive. The letters on the door say, International Detective Bureau, Anthony J. Lyon, President. They used to be in gold, but the Lyons scraped them off one day and made some kind of a deal with Fort Knox. Oh, it isn't much of an office. One room the size of a cigar box, and it smells about the same. There's an overstuffed chair in one corner with a loose spring that's a menace. Right over it, there's a crack in the ceiling. But the lion doesn't seem to mind. He says the place is rigged for comfort. Well, that's where I was at 525 last Wednesday night. The lion was sitting behind the desk looking at himself in a mirror. What he saw should have scared him. A pair of shoe button eyes mounted in a head like a Spanish onion. You know, Regan, I don't feel like I used to. Neither do the Republicans. I think I've got that middle-aged look. Uh, just the spread. It's getting a little scarce on top. Change your shampoo. I shouldn't be getting bald at my age. I'm only 39. Your addition is kind of bad, isn't it? Uh, I guess it's because I got so much worry. None of this business takes a lot out of a man. Takes more out of your clients. They get good service at reasonable rates. Mm, well, I've heard the commercial. Regan. Cancel all arrangements for tonight. You're going to be busy. Doing what? That's the trouble with you, young man. Too hasty. Learn how to relax. Like me. Tell that to your ulcer. Ever hear of a lady named Hazel Carr? No. Well, you're going to. She's a businesswoman and we got business with her. What kind? Later. When? Anthony J. Lyon, international detective. Yeah. 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 1302 Beachwood. Right away, Mrs. Carr. Okay, there's the kickoff, Regan. Who's playing? You and a red headed guy. Hop over to this address and hide behind a tree or something. I forgot my beard. You'll see a red headed guy coming out of the house in about 45 minutes. Get a real good look at him. Why? He's the guy you're going to study so you'll know him any time you see him. Where does Hazel Carr fit? She's inside the house. After you spot the guy, go in and see her. Fill in the rest. She'll give you all you gotta know. Now get moving and stay on the ball. I work for you. How can I get off? Well, I left the lion sitting there and I drove out to the Beechwood address. It turned out to be a corner house stuck on the top of a hill and it figured a good rain would wash it down the drain. Well, I parked across the street and lit a cigarette. Watched a kid on a bicycle throwing newspapers. His aim was real good. He got them all on the roof. 
I watched him finish the block, and that's when my knee action began to suffer. A heavy guy in a trench coat had his foot on my running board. He had a big face, and he turned it sideways and stuck it in the window. What's the matter, buddy? Out of gas? No, my foot fell asleep. Oh. How about a light? Want a light? Got one. Okay. Out of fluid, anyway. Well, pull your head out of here before you lose it. It's all right. I always carry a spare. Come on, beat it, Buster. You spoil my view. Oh. Peeking, huh? Maybe. You say maybe? I say yes. All right, what do you want? Same as you. You're looking? I'm looking. Whose side you on? Depends. On what? Whose side you're on. See ya. That was when the front door of the car house opened and six feet of pinstripe gray came out on the sidewalk. His 200 pounds was topped off with a bush of red hair and he had a face to match. It had a flushed look, like a high school boy at a burlesque show. He started down the street. The guy in the trench coat crossed over the other side and moved after him, kind of slow. Then they disappeared around the corner. Well, he was playing his hand, I was playing mine. I climbed out of my car and walked up to the door of the car place. The bell sounded like something that should have been in Buckingham. But the woman who answered wasn't any queen. Yes? My name's Regan, International Detective Bureau. Oh, Lion's Eye. Please come in, Mr. Regan. I'm Hazel Carr. All right. You saw him, I suppose. The redhead? Rather large, isn't he? The Dons are missing a bet. Sit down, Mr. Regan. May I offer you something? I'll try a story. We'll get to that in a moment. What's wrong with right now? We have other things to discuss. You have a dark suit, I suppose. Yeah, I got it on. Well, get it pressed. You're going out tonight, Mr. Regan. I'm already booked. Then disappointed. You see, from now on, you're working for me. Come on, strike a match, lady. I don't like the dark. You're going to meet the 710 at the Union Station. My daughter Phyllis is coming in. She's been at an Eastern school getting finished. How'd she turn up? Just a vacation. She's dying to see Hollywood. She should have a young man. Well, I'm no escort bureau. I want more than an escort for Phyllis. I want a man with authority. She play that rough? That redhead you saw. He thinks he's in love with her. We all make mistakes. But he's impetuous. Follows her all over. He even threatened her. He says he'll kill her and himself if she doesn't marry him. Well, either way, he loses. I don't care about him. It's Phyllis that worries me. She's so young. Mm-hmm. But I don't want her to know that things are so bad she needs protection. You must remember that. Maybe she'll figure it out herself. Don't let her. Anyway, I've wired her that a young man was going to meet her at the train to show her around. A nice young man. Can you act the part? I'll try. I'll see that you do. Who's that boy out in front in the trench coat? I don't know what you mean. Okay. Anything else? I made your reservations for dinner dancing at the Grove, and I show her a good time. You're paying the bills. And keep her occupied until I figure out a way to get rid of that redhead. Murder might work. Now, think about it. Call me after you pick her up. Sure. Now, you you better go. Okay. Oh, uh, Mr. Regan. Yeah? Here. What's this? Emily Post. Read up on your manners. Well, I figured she wasn't telling everything, but it was her play. I headed for my place to clean up before meeting the train. It took a little time bucking traffic on Franklin. At Gower, I played tag with the truck driver trying hard to crease my fenders. It was about 6.15 when I pulled to a stop in front of my apartment. When I opened the door, I smelled cigar smoke. Somebody was over for a slumber party. A short, stocky guy with a stub crammed in his face was sleeping on the bed. He must have been having a real good dream because he was tough to wake up. Hey, come on, buddy, hey. Come on, the alarm just went off. Oh, hiya, Regan. Guess I dozed off waiting for you. Pajamas in the top drawer. How are you? Like a scratch. No, kind of late last night. You should have stayed home today. Had to see you. What for? Oh, you know what's a pretty crummy mattress you got? Well, I'll put in for a beauty rest. <laughs> yeah. Do that, Regan. All right, punk, let's get to it. Ease off, ease off, Pilgrim. I'm still shaking a sand out. Well, get up and start talking. Easy, easy. Name's Mo. I'm a friend. Convince me. I'm going to. Hey. Think it's something to drink around? Maybe after the talk. Like, uh, Who sent you? Your insurance company. I'm paid up. 
I'm not in the collection department. What else they got? Friendly service, goodwill. Getting close to Christmas. Yeah, I'll send you a card. Don't want no card. Just want the pleasure of knowing I did you a service. Name the kind. Guys going to meet trains have accidents sometimes. Santa Fe's not going to like you. But I figure you will. Tipping you how to stay healthy. My doctor tells me vitamins. Mo says it's a wrong dope. Skip the train and take in a show. I don't like popcorn. It'd pay you to learn. You want to tell me why? You got enough. How about that drink, friend? You didn't earn it. Suit yourself, people. But being nice is really a neck with me. I'm pretty nasty. That won't get you an argument. I'd even hit a guy two feet shorter than me. Yeah, I'm turning pale. That's a good color for you, Regan. Stay that way. <laughs> He chewed on the cigar a couple of times, and then he went out to find a spittoon. Oh, the whole thing had a crummy look like a box of stale crackers. I tried to figure whether he was working for the redhead or grubbing around on his own, but not enough scenes were in to make it a full picture. Well, the car woman was writing the checks, and I was still trying. So I cleaned up, threw on some fresh clothes, and made it to the Union Station a little after seven. The super chief was just coming in. The station master, who walked with a slight list, took her name and said he'd bring her to me. And then I fought my way to the restaurant, and the waiter brought me a cup of coffee. He's a skinny little guy with a lot of neck muscles. I guess he got that way from talking so much. Are you going someplace, mister? Just been. Oh, got fun? It wasn't bad. Sugar? No, thanks. Oh, well, that's no good for you anyway. Gives you diabetes. You know, mister, I gotta go someplace myself sometime. I got a suggestion. I've been working here 12 years, yeah. People come, people go. Pete Brody stays on forever. Hey, cream? No. Well, it's just as well it's sour. <laughs> you know the farthest place I ever go, mister? That first door to the right. Uh, I, I, are you Mr. Uh, Regan? Yeah. I believe you're waiting for me. You got a name? Phyllis Carr. That'll do. Oh, well, darling, aren't you going to ask me to sit down? You can handle that yourself. Well, thank you. Where's your baggage? Uh, we'll have to pick it up. Are you going someplace, lady? I just got in. I've been figuring on going someplace myself. I was just telling your friend here. Get us some uh, coffee. Uh, but I... I've Get been... it. Okay, okay. I'm just being friendly. Yeah, I'm going to adore it here. Town full of mashers. You'll get along. I'm much older than I look, you know. Carry a sign. Well, you don't seem very happy with me. I'm dreadfully sorry. You're much better than I expected. Your mother thought different. Oh, she's a dear. I thought at first she might pick me one of those children from UCLA. Well, I'll grow up. But darling, who can wait that long? I want to have fun while I'm young. Look, what kind of school do you go to? All girls. Well, that explains a little. And it's very progressive. Here's your coffee, lady. Oh, thank you so much. Oh, I don't mention it, lady. Yeah, like I was telling your friend here before. Uh, where are you going, Mr. Reed? I figured on going... No, not you. Me. Uh, me. Oh, the phone your mother. Say hello to the dear for me. I'm going to say a lot more. Now, you sit right there till I get back. Oh, whatever you say, darling. I'll be making myself more beautiful. Save that for the redhead. Where'd you hear about him? News gets around. You're more my type. Now, you better settle for UCLA. You don't want to wind up an old maid. Well, it wasn't appealing. Nursemaid to a junior miss, trying hard to work up a sweat. The curtain wasn't down, but I was ready to call off the show. I scratched around for a nickel, and I found the phone booth between the newsstand and a broom closet. There was some old gal inside with a waffle for a hat, having a private filibuster. When she finished, I went in and started to dial Hazel Carr. That's when I spotted that redhead in the pinstripe working his way through the crowd. He had an eager look, like an English setter flushing quail. I threw the receiver back on the hook and started for Phyllis. As soon as I stepped out of the booth, the thunder broke. Somebody threw two slugs into the redhead and his light went out. The crowd began to gather, so I went back for Phyllis. It was hard going. I was moving against the grain. Hey, hey, boy, tell me you're going. What? I heard the shot. Come on. Hey. Hey, you. 
some excitement outside. Hey, mister. Call homicide. I've been working here 12 years, seen a lot of things. Where'd she go? One day a whack chased the major all no, over the place. Oh, listen. Hey. Now, listen. That blonde sitting over in the corner with a high meter reading. Where'd she go? Hey, you spill on the clock. Now, see what you've done. What happened to her? Leave me alone. Give it to me. She went out. When? Well, just after you did. Before or after the shot? I, I don't remember. Well, think. Before. Yeah, yeah, before. I, I remember watching the way she walked. Did she get a date? Uh, she tried, but she said she was going steady with a red-headed guy. Well, things weren't going to get any better at the Union Station. Homicide would be down there scratching around. So I used the back door of the restaurant, picked up my car, and went out to the Lions. When he opened the front door, he had a bottle of beer in one hand and a chicken sandwich in the other. He looked unhappy, like a beaver with a loose tooth. Reason, where you been? I've been looking all over for you. Did you try missing persons? Called your place three times, nobody answered. You knew I was working. That's what I called you about. I got something to tell you. Well, wait your turn. What's the matter with you? In trouble again? No, you are, big shot. Another bum client. International detective never had a bum client. Well, those two women just spoiled your record. You've been drinking. You better call homicide and get us off that hook and then turn back Carr's retainer. Reason, what do you say? You heard me. But it's unethical to return money. When Anthony J. Lyons... Oh, stop it, will you? Work. You quit giving blood when you find out somebody pay for it. You're out of line. Every time you cut yourself, you make a beeline for the Red Cross to get it back. International detectives under obligation to Mrs. Carr, and we're going to see you through. All right. You hold her hand in the gas chamber. What does that mean? That's where she's going to be after the police get through. What, what happened? That redhead got himself a free ride to the morgue. It looks like her daughter, Phyllis Carr, called the play. You're out of your mind. Look at this telegram. Uh, let me see. It's from Phyllis Carr in New York. She just ran away from school with a Princeton man. You are listening to the story of the lady with too much hair. Tonight's adventure with Jeff Regan, the investigator. Commissions are still available in the Army Nurse Corps. Graduate registered nurses between the ages of 21 and 45 may qualify for service with this fine organization. Nurses may request active or inactive status. Those on active status enjoy the same privileges as regular Army officers. Those on inactive status may continue their civilian nursing duties, but stand ready to serve in time of emergency. If you are interested in joining the Army Nurse Corps and believe you qualify for a commission... Apply to the Adjutant General, Washington, D.C. And now, back to Jeff Regan, Investigator, and the story of the lady with too much hair. Well, it all made sense like a girdle on a Siamese twin. Started out with a redhead and a pinstripe and wound up a nursemaid job with a girl named Phyllis. While I'm in a phone booth, somebody throws a couple of sleeping pills at the redheaded guy. The smoke cleared and Red's doing the big sleep in Union Station and my date somewhere else. The lion makes it a Sunday special with a telegram that says everything is off. Well, it didn't take 20-20 vision to see that the girl in the station was a substitute or the telegram was a phony. Well, yeah, it was easy to figure my next move. I went across the street and I found a booth way over in the corner. I was two drinks into the house when the skinny guy in the trench coat eased down beside me. Hi, Regan. Think it all helps? You get around. So do you. Still following people? I gave up. You? You got something to say? I'm just here for a friendly drink. Try the bartender. I like conversation. What kind? All kind. Bourbon and water. I don't look so worried, Regan. I'll pay for my own. You're going to make a night of it? I can't. Got things to do. Got to find a man who shot a man. What man? The one I followed. The one you watched. Any idea? Yeah. Who? You. <laughs> Bum joke, Regan. Well, why'd you follow him? My business. Besides, I lost him in a traffic jam. Here you are, mate. Thanks. Well, here's to the newspaper. Uh, seen this one yet with pictures? All about our friend. Fine murder story. No, I worked the crosswords. Oh, give me crime and lots of it. You know why? No, tell me why. It's sin, and sin is here to stay. All right, you said your piece. Hmm. Unknown assailant fires two shots and a traveler at Union Station. Listening? It's an old story. Think so? 
He got his red hair dirty on the floor. Uh Uh-uh. Wrong caper. Well, I'll catch up later. This guy was different. How? Bald, like a boiled egg. Crazy, give me that. See what I mean? The guy in the picture ain't got red hair, got no hair. What's your angle, Buster? Like I said, I read papers. Why? I thought maybe you belonged to the barber's union. Well, it turned out to be an even trade. I took his newspaper, and he got my ice and the drink. Well, I went back to the office and sat down and tried to figure it out. It was all crazy, like an Eskimo with a popsicle. I started by calling Hazel Carr's house, but the nickel came back. The phone book gave a business address, so I drove out there. It was a pink stucco job out on Olympic right after you pass Redondo. A red neon sign told you that Hazel Carr Incorporated specialized in hair pieces. Nobody answered up front, so I slipped around to the back door. The door opened into a workroom. I scratched a match. Somebody had been looking for something, and it wasn't dandruff. Every wig in the place was torn apart. It was just about then that I heard a step, and then a flashlight jumped out at me, and I smelled a cigar. It was Mo. Hi, Regan. Well... Sleeping Beauty. I'm awake this time. I'm impressed. Tell me more. Stand still, Regan. This alarm clock goes off. It's already rung. I didn't do it. Body in Union Station? Chamber of Commerce gets upset. I'm from Florida. Figure to bring up the orange crop? Didn't do this either. Spit out the seeds. Regan, you're not friendly. You got here first. I'm here all the time. Well, you're trying too hard, Mo. I work here. It's a serious business. We make billiard balls happy. All right, so you work for Hazel Carr. Say something with hormones. You're learning nothing that's not in the trades. Why'd you snatch the redhead's toupee? You make me tired of saying I didn't. Couldn't meet his installments? The count, you'll get credit. What's in that toupee? You've asked enough questions, Regan. Relax, buddy. You'll burn out your coils. You're in the way. I told you once. I was born on the second honeymoon. Well, happy birthday, Junior. Ooh! I was lying face down in a pile of Santa Claus beards and yak tails. When I rolled over, there was the lion. He was shaking like a polar bear in a French bathing suit. Wake up. We gotta wake up. I could hire a detective for the price of you. Get a midget and he'd starve to death. You got a client. She needs you. What are you, Silent Arrow? I'm a nursemaid with you around. She called the office. Gonna have another daughter? I told you it's legitimate. She didn't know nothing about the phony. Where is she now? 1629 Locust Avenue. Why? She's in the middle of a smuggle. You sure? It adds up. She pays the bill. She's straight. How'd you meet her in the first place? I got a right to a private life. Not at your age. So I left the lion standing here and I climbed in my car. I made a couple of right turns in the wrong zone, but I found the address all right. 1629 turned out to be a two-story Monterey number in the middle of what looked like a golf course. Hazel Carr owned this place, too. She must have been selling toupees to Crosby's whole stable. I parked the car and I headed for the lights that were on downstairs. I took the front steps two at a time. Well. Well, if it isn't UCLA. I just got in from Berkeley. Oh, don't be bitter. I'm not. Where you been? Jealous. You're fickle. Just when I'm in college. Lucky student, buddy. I didn't know you noticed. Well, skip it. It was a lousy act anyway. It's good enough to fool you. Going somewhere? I got a date. If it's with Mrs. Carr, don't bother. I sent for you. You better try again. Your boss just got a phone call. Well, if I put on one act, I can put on another, can't I? You didn't kill Red. Uh, it's not important. Yes, it is. Come on back inside. We're going to have a threesome. I like it better at the zebra room. You could find a dark place. That'll come later. Uh uh-uh. uh. I'm leaving. No, you're not inside, sir. Well, you don't have to coax me. Where is she? Uh, Mrs. Carr. Look, it wasn't me. She's been dead a long time. So's your alibi. I've only been here for five minutes. You're lying. I'll make you listen to me. Look out. Drop it. You pick up that gun and I'll break you in two. Oh, stop it. Get me a drink. Some over there. All right. Look, I didn't kill him. Not either one of them. Sure. 
You don't believe anything. Depends on the source. Here, this will slow you down. Thanks. All right, now let's start talking. He got me into it. Mo? Maybe. Say yes. Don't be personal. You get me out of the way so he can plug the redhead and snatch the toupee. Mo is impulsive. That's all. Forget about him. But the toupee was empty, so the two of you have to scratch around some other places for it. Shall I run my fingers through your hair? Let's stick to the subject. I wish you would. Did the redhead know he was carrying an empty load? Nobody did, except Mrs. Carr. It was a smuggle and she was holding out. It's a mistake for a woman, don't you think? They had a trio and she wanted to sing solo. The boys weren't smart like you are. Maybe she was worried about her daughter. Maybe she wanted to go straight and the boys didn't want her to. You're wasting our time. Let me show you where I sit in. No, you're on the wrong floor. There's a way to fix everything. You're an accessory. I can become essential. You'd get lipstick on my expense account. Come here. I'll break it up, baby. You scratched around every place. You still can't find the goods. I think I found it. You figure the old lady used me as a safety deposit box? Where else could it be? All right, supposing I got it, what next? Do I have to draw a diagram? We might as well be realistic about this thing. What's it worth? Fifty thousand dollars of the white stuff. I don't like to dream. You look like you could use one. I'm extra. Meet the contract there. Oh. Oh, yeah, this act figured to do it. Mo. You had a good memory. Mo, baby, I... Skip it. Stand still, Pilgrim. I, w- I was trying to get it from I you. heard that song. That Regan might like to hear the chorus. Oh. oh. <laughs> Mr. Bet Regan. You should grab an offer when it's hot. <laughs> Don't be sad, Pilgrim. She smiled at all the boys. Come on, let's get out of here. You'll look better with slow paralysis. Well, I had about as much chance as a clean towel in a boarding house. When the muscle said move, I had to be polite. I guess he figured the car place was too crowded and he wanted new scenery. Well, we went out to the street and he steered me for his car. It was a black job with white sidewalls. And there were two suitcases in the back seat. But all his bags weren't packed. He was missing a small package, and he had the idea it was over at my place. When we got there, it was about midnight, but it wasn't too late for him to go to work. Now, isn't this better, Regan? Home sweet home. I never liked it anyway. Move. I got a lease. Those things can be broken. Want me to show you how? No, I'll struggle along. You make things hard on yourself. Now, do something the easy way. Get me the stuff. You're wasting your time. I got lots of it, you ain't. Well, I haven't got it. Mo thinks you have. Well, and he's pretty dumb. You... That's on account I don't like your choice of words. Buy me a dictionary. You're going to get yourself two big holes in your middle if you don't lay that stuff in my hand. <laughs> Sorry I had to do that to him, Regan. I, I forgive you. I just came up to get my newspaper back, and he was acting nasty. The little guy in the bar. My boss doesn't like it when I shoot people. Uncle Sam, huh? Mm Mm-hmm. Narcotics. I tried to tip you off before, but you weren't listening. Somebody should have tipped Mo. Why didn't you watch it? I just did. Well was all over fast, like a short beer in a cheap saloon. They took him away in a basket, and all I had left was a spot on the rug. They had a good thing until Hazel Carr got anxious and decided to pull out. Only she wanted to be clean and have the stuff, too. That's what started the scavenger hunt. The only thing straight in the whole corkscrew was the part about the daughter needing protection. But I guess she got it back at Princeton. The stuff? Oh, it finally turned up. Hazel Carr had found herself a good place to hide it. The feds spotted it the first thing the next morning when he saw the lion. How could he miss? The lion looked awful in that red toupee. Jack Webb is featured as Jeff Regan with Herb Butterfield as Anthony J. Lyon. It's CBS at the same time next week for more hard-boiled action and mystery with Jeff Regan, Investigator. Written by Larry Roman and Jackson Gillis. Produced by Sterling Tracy. 
Included in tonight's cast were Mary Lansing, Ken Christie, Sidney Miller, Lorette Philbrandt, and Ed Barrier. 29,000 nurses are needed to join the new Army Nurse Corps Officers Reserve. For the first time in history, qualified nurses have the opportunity of receiving commissions in the regular Army Reserve. These nurses will remain on inactive status, ready to serve their country in time of emergency. 4,000 of them, if they wish, may choose active duty. All nurses who receive commissions will benefit from the opportunity for specialized training offered to them by the Army. Inactive reserve status will not interfere with the nurse's civilian life. If you're a registered graduate nurse between the ages of 21 and 45, drop a card to the Adjutant General, Washington, D.C. Original music for this program is by Milton Charles. Bob Stevenson speaking. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting... Sergeant, you're assigned a juvenile detail. You get a call from Georgia Street Receiving Hospital. A two-year-old child has been brought in. Her condition is critical. There's evidence of foul play. Your job, check it out. It was Sunday, August 14th. It was warm in Los Angeles. We're working the night watch out of juvenile detail. My partner is Frank Smith. The boss is Captain Powers. My name is Friday. I was on my way back from detention cells, and it was 7.28 p.m. when I got to the second floor of Georgia Street Junior. Squad room. Hi, how'd it go? Nothing. Those kids won't cop to a thing. Hmm. What about the weapons? Only admit they had them, and that's all. Nothing about what they were going to do with them? No. I don't know, Joe. Today, kids got a lot more than we ever had. TV, cars, a lot of things. Yeah. Still seems like they aren't happy unless they're figuring how to beat somebody's brains out. Well, it doesn't go for all of them. Well, enough to give us a headache. Yeah. And take those kids upstairs. If they spent the same time doing something constructive that they do making the zip guns and saps, they'd have something worthwhile, something worth remembering. Well, maybe it'll work out the same way. What do you mean? They won't forget this. You and old Friday. Yeah, Doc. Why don't you come in? Anybody with it? Give me that again, will you? Yeah, I got it. Okay. We'll check it. That's right. We'll get back to you later. Thanks, Doc. Bye. It was Dr. Sebastian. Yeah? Just brought a little girl into emergency. Had convulsions. How's she doing? Dead on arrival. Frank and I notified Homicide Division, then we left the office and drove out to the address I'd gotten on the phone. 1784 Malabar Street was a small wooden house set on the back of the lot. A dead oak tree in the front yard was overgrown with ivy. Several broken and rusted children's toys were half hidden in the weeds near the front porch. We rang the front doorbell. Somebody ought to be home. The lights are on. Let's try it again. Mm. Yeah, somebody's coming. Uh Yes? Ms. Manson? That's right. We're the one. Police officers would like to talk to you. We have to go through it all again. Don't you think I feel bad enough? We're sorry to bother you, ma'am, but there's some questions we have to ask you. All right, come on in. You might as well sit down. Thank you. Thank you. This is Frank Smith, and my name's Friday. How do you do, Miss Manson? Hello. You're the child's aunt, is that right? Yeah. Her mother's my sister. And where is her mother? I don't know. I've been trying to get in touch with her. Left messages all over town, but I guess she ain't got any of them. The child stayed with you, does she? Yeah. Been here since she was six months old. Feel like she was my own. Mm-hmm. I've got three kids myself, all boys. Always one of the girl. When Joan said I could have Melissa, it made me feel real good. Like a daughter of my own, real good. Mm-hmm. No, it didn't make any difference to Joan. None at all. Wasn't anything that mattered much to her. I always thought Melissa was something that shouldn't have happened. In the way, that's what she said. Yes, ma'am. In the way. Mm-hmm. What happened this evening? What do you mean? Well, you're the one who called the hospital, aren't you? Yeah. As soon as I knew there was something wrong, called him. Mm-hmm. Well, what happened? Well, this is Sunday. Yes. 
Every Sunday morning, Joan comes by and picks up Melissa, takes her for the day. Mm-hmm. Just like always, she was here this morning. Yes, ma'am. It's going to be a big day. She told the baby they were going up to Griffith Park to the zoo, see the animals. Mm-hmm. Oh, we all sat around and ate. My kids and baby and Joan and the kids went to get dressed. Yeah. After she was dressed, they left. Joan and Melissa going to the zoo on the ride. Real big day, real big. Mm-hmm. About six, they came back. That's this evening? Yeah, six o'clock. The baby, the baby didn't look real good, kind of hot and flushed. Yeah. I asked Joan if she'd given her a lot of junk. She said no, nothing but it hurt her. That's what she said. Mm-hmm. She just came in the house, and then she left. Said she had an appointment, that she couldn't be late. Just dumped the baby inside the house and walked out. I see. I gave her a bath. Thought it might make her feel better. She's running a little fever. Warm bath supposed to bring down the temperature. That's okay. it. Didn't. Didn't do any good at all. I asked her if she was hungry. She said she was, so I gave her some dinner. Had no more than taken one bite, and she had the first sip. Mm-hmm. Sitting right there at the table, and she had it. I didn't know what to do. Never had nothing happen like that before. I didn't know what to give her. Did you call a doctor? Yeah. We don't have a telephone, so I went down to the corner. There's a booth at the gas station. Yeah. Didn't want to leave the baby alone, but there wasn't any other way. Nothing else I could do. All right. What happened? doctor wasn't at home. I left work for him to come right over, and then I came back. Then no sooner walked into the house, and she had another fit. Scared me to death. Poor little thing. I could see she was in pain, terrible pain. There wasn't anything I could do for her. Mm-hmm. I just couldn't wait anymore. I went back and called the emergency hospital, asked them to send an ambulance. Told them it was important and to send somebody right away. A couple minutes after that, the men got here and took her away. Poor little thing. Yes, ma'am. She looked at me, like asking me to stop the pain. Begging me, almost tore my heart right out of my chest to see her so little. Almost killed me. Yes. She was dead when they got her there. Didn't even live long enough for them to try and save her. Not even that long. Yes, ma'am, we know. Just a baby. Two years old and she's dead. Just a tiny little baby. Oh, I've hardly seen A lot of people could die and it wouldn't make any difference. But not her. She was beautiful. Like my daughter, like my own. <laughs> you sure there isn't something we can get for you, Miss Moore? No, nothing. There's anything that will help now. Nothing at all. Now, ma'am, has there been any history of this type of attack in your family? You mean fit? Epilepsy. Anything of that nature? No, I've never been anything like that. Well, now, did the child tell you that she felt sick? Mm-mm. We didn't have no idea there was something wrong until it was too late. Did she complain of stomach cramps, do you remember? No, she didn't. What did you have for dinner? Ground meat, potatoes, green beans. Couldn't have been that made her sick. We all ate the same thing. The kids and me, none of us had any trouble. Oh, yeah. Is your sister separated from her husband? Yeah, they hadn't been together for over a year. Been that long anyway, I suppose. He's supposed to contribute support, but he doesn't. Not a dime. I see. Did she provide support for the little girl? She was the baby's mother, but that's as far as it went. Came to count from Melissa and it landed in my lap. Remember when she had Roseola? Joan didn't even come over and see her. Just didn't care. Mailed a little doll for the baby. Guess that was supposed to make up for her mother not being there. Can you tell us where we can contact your sister? Sure. Place over on Hewitt Street. Got an apartment there. You have the address? Yeah. Won't do much good to go over there, though. Why is that? She probably ain't home. Chances are she's out someplace running around having a good time. I see. Don't even know that baby's dead. Hasn't got the slightest idea. Oh, we'll go and see her. Hope you won't mind waiting for her to show up. You're going to have to. Probably wait a long time. Yes, ma'am. She don't care about the baby. Never did. It's only a couple of times. Just a rock around her neck. Talked about how hard it was for her to get a husband with a kid. All, all the time, how the baby was making it hard for her. Mm-hmm. All she ever thought about herself. Didn't want anything to interfere with that. Just herself. She won't care about the baby. She won't care at all. Probably won't even talk to you. I think she will. Why should she? No reason for her to even see you. Yes, there is. What? We're trying to find out why the child died. Oh, she just got sick, that's all. There's anything more to it. Melissa just got sick. You seem pretty sure about it. Of course I am. Could be anything else. You think there was anything else? You think there was something wrong? We don't know yet. Well, then talk to Joan. Ask her. Anything wrong with Melissa that happened today, she ought to be able to tell you. Talk to her. Yes, ma'am. That's what we'll do. Hope it does you some good. Wouldn't surprise me a bit if she knows what had happened. What's that? She's probably got an idea. I, I wouldn't want her to know I told you this. What do you mean? 
If there's something wrong with the way Melissa died, if there is... Yes, ma'am. It would surprise me if Joan killed her. Frank and I left the house and drove over to the apartment on Hewitt Street. The name on the mailbox read Joan Guyman. We rang a bell, but there was no answer. We talked to the landlady, Mrs. Enid Finden. She told us that the Guyman woman had left the place about 7.15 in the company of a man and she hadn't returned. We asked her what she could tell us about Miss Guyman. It's kind of hard to say right off. She's funny, you know how I mean? No, ma'am. Well, there's a lot of people who don't like her. Lots of them. They think she's kind of wild the way she runs around, partying up. You'll hear a lot of talk about her. You've got to kind of make up your own mind about it. Mm-hmm. You any idea where we can find her? No, could be in half a dozen places. If Scott's on a run, she's liable not to slow down for a couple of days. You know the man she's with? Mm, sorry, I can't help you there. I've seen him before, but not many times. I don't think Joan goes out with him much. Mm-hmm. Something wrong? No. Yeah. Something happened to Joan? No, ma'am. Must be some reason you're nosing around. Anything you want to tell me? It might be a little better if we talk to Ms. Guyman. That's the way you want it. I ain't going to pry into something don't concern me. Yes, ma'am. Have you ever met Mrs. Guyman's little girl? You mean Melissa? Yes, ma'am. Sure. Two of them been here several times. Sundays, you know, Joan has a little girl. How do they seem to get along? What? Ms. Guyman and her daughter. How do they get along? Well, you said it yourself. Melissa's her daughter. Now. Yeah. What do you heard? Hmm? Somebody's been talking about how Joan treats the kid. Well, maybe you better tell her. I don't want to get in no trouble. You understand that. Yeah. Well, I'd be down here watching the television, maybe doing some ironing, and right here, Joan yell at the baby. Wow. She used words a kid shouldn't hear, not that young. Yes, ma'am. Of course, not that those kind of words are ever good for a youngster, but sure not for one only two years old. Yeah. Anyway, she'd yell for a while, then it'd be quiet. Then she hit the kid a couple of times, things calmed down. Now, do you know if Mrs. Guyman ever hit her daughter? Well, sure. I saw it with my own eyes. Mm-hmm. We had words about it. Well, Joan told me to mind my own business. Had to keep my nose where it belonged. Told me how Melissa was her kid, and if she thought a slap would do some good, she was going to give it. Mm-hmm. She did. Only a couple times they weren't slaps. Mm-hmm. Like this. With a closed fist. Sit right along here. Right above the ear. A couple times in the face. I saw the kid with a black eye myself, sure. Does Mr. Guyman see his wife? Not that I know. He said a couple times that he doesn't. I don't think she even knows where he is. Kind of sad, you know. Ma'am? Yeah. What happened? That's how all the trouble started. Mr. Guyman. Both of them used to live here when they got married. They thought they seemed pretty happy. Didn't have no idea there was anything wrong. Mm-hmm. Then when the baby was born, the trouble started. It wasn't long before the whole building knew about it. Of course, there was a couple of people who had an idea before. What's that? About her. Yeah. Oh, running around, down to the bars, drinking, talking with other men. Now, I'm not approved. Never been anybody who could say that about me. Nobody. Mm-hmm. But I just don't believe in married women doing it. Not them. That's what caused the trouble, then, huh? You just put it down to that. Oh, my, they had some big arguments. Big ones. Hear them all over the building. All over the block, I guess, if he was listening. Mm-hmm. Well, it wasn't long after that he walked out on her. Left her flat for the baby. I see. Packed right up and moved out. Even took his photograph of it. everything. I don't think you've seen him since. Well, are they divorced, you know? I don't know about that. Sometimes she's talked about getting one. I don't think she's ever gone through with it. No, she's planning on it. Okay. She wants to get married again. Told me that a hundred times, how she wants to find a man and settle down. Just about all she talks about. Yes, the big problem is Melissa. Mm-hmm. Well, I know she's had the chance. I know that for sure. Mm-hmm. A couple of them have even talked to me about it. About how they want to marry Joan. Go to home for her. All comes back to the same thing. What's that? The kid. None of the men want a ready-made family. They're all willing to have one of their own, but... It ain't easy for a woman with a two-year-old child. Not easy at all. Mm-hmm. I know she thought a couple times about leaving the kid with her sister. Some kind of problem there, too. See, they're always fighting about it. Do you know what the arguments were about? Sure. Joan's sister didn't think she was doing enough to support the kid, you know. Figured she ought to have more money. Any of these quarrels ever get violent? Yeah, I heard them upstairs, yelling and screaming at each other. Almost as bad as Joan and her husband. Sister saying that either she had to hand over more money or else take Melissa out of the house. Joan saying that she didn't care what happened to the kid, yelling all over the place. Terrible the way they carried on. Mm-hmm. To be honest about it, I don't think either one of them really wanted a little girl. Neither one of them. Right. Both been just as happy if she'd never been born. Poor little kid. Wonder they didn't try to put her in another home, you know, find some people who wanted her. But given her a chance to grow up being loved. That's right. At least they could have done, given a little kid a chance. Oh, I don't know. Maybe someday Joan will wake up. Realize what she's doing. Mm-hmm. 
Maybe she will. Let's hope it's not too late. In the company of the manager, Frank and I checked Joan Diamond's room. There was no indication that she wasn't going to return. We asked Miss Bindon to notify us as soon as she heard from the diamond room. We returned to the office and checked with the crime lab. They finished going over the child's clothing and they hadn't found anything out of order. We put in a call to the coroner's office and we talked to Chief Deputy Coroner Vic Wallage. He told us that the autopsy would be held at 10 a.m. the following morning and that we should have the results by 11. He went on to say that in his examination of Melissa Guyman, he'd found several bruises on her neck and back. However, he was unable to tell us if the blows might have been strong enough to cause her death. 12.16 a.m., we ran the names Joan Guyman and her sister through r and There was no record on the sister, but we found that the Guyman woman had been arrested several times in the last year on charges of 4127A, drunk. The rest of the night was spent in checking out the places she was known to have frequented. An attempt was made to find her husband without result. The next day, Frank and I met in the squad room early to put through a call to the coroner's office. Yeah. Mm Mm-hmm. What about the bruises? I see. How long is that going to take? Right. We'll keep in touch with you. Okay. Bye. How about it? They finished. What's the cause of death? I'm still not sure. What do you mean? They think she might have been poisoned. The autopsy had failed to show the cause of death of Melissa Guyman. Further tests were to be conducted. In the meantime, the search for her mother continued. A check with a landlady showed the victim's mother hadn't returned to her home during the night. We contacted her sister, but she told us she hadn't heard from Joan Guyman. The afternoon papers carried a story on the little girl's death. Frank and I checked with Sergeant Jay Allen again, but he hadn't come up with anything new. 3.20 p.m. You want to go out and see the sister? I don't think it's going to do much good. She said she'd call if she heard anything. Yeah. I got it. You have an old spare? Yeah, that's right. Hmm? Yeah, we have. Well, where are you? All right, stay right there. That's right. Huh? As soon as we can. Joan Diamond. Where is she? Far down on East Fifth. She know about the little girl? Yeah, wants to see us right away. Well, it makes us even. She's got more of a reason. Hmm? So she killed her daughter. City Hall and drove over to the bar. When we walked into the place, it appeared to be deserted. The bartender told us there was a woman answering the description we gave him in one of the rear booths. Joan Diamond was in her late 20s, but she looked at least 40. She'd been drinking heavily and she'd been crying. Yeah. Somebody you're looking for? You're Miss Diamond. That's right. Who are you? Police officers. Frank Smith. My name is Friday. Yeah. I knew you'd be here. No good. Why don't you sit right down and make yourself comfortable? Which one of you fellas I talk to? You talk to me. Yeah. Well, then you know why I asked you to come down here. Yes, ma'am. You want to tell us about it? No. How's that? You asked me if I wanted to talk about it. Well, I don't. I don't even want to think about it. I wish it never happened. Is that right? You probably think it's funny I'm not crying, don't you? Don't you? You think there's something wrong with me? My baby's dead and I'm not crying? Well, do you want to know why? You want to know? Why don't you tell us, lady? Because there ain't no tears left. Not a single one. I'm all cried out. That's why. Better put that down. You've had enough of that. I think I'll have a lot more. A lot more. You said you killed your little girl, is that right? That's right. Well, tell us about it, will you? No reason not to. No reason for anything anymore. All right, go ahead. I killed her. I killed her. It's like I'd put a gun up to her head. I killed her. Is this the same? Go ahead. Oh, poor old kid. She didn't want much. Hardly anything. One of those dolls with the hair you can wave, that's all. The doll with curly hair and her mother. She got the doll. I gave it to her yesterday when we came back from the zoo. It's just seeing how happy she was. She yeah. was happy. Mm-hmm. Another thing I, I wouldn't give her. No mother. Poor little kid. She doesn't have no mother. 
just me, that's all, isn't it? Yeah. That's how I did it. What's that? Tell her. If I'd been her mother and kept her with me, it never would have happened. She'd be all right now. Neglect. That's what did it. Neglect. And I gave it to her. Never paid no attention to her. All the time, too busy with what I was doing. I didn't pay any attention to her. I didn't pay any attention at all. All right, come on, lady. Where are we going? Downtown. What for? I think we'll be able to talk better there. Oh, I don't want to go anyplace. I'm going to stay right here. My baby is dead. Poor little kid didn't have no mother. Why don't you just go away and leave me alone? You know, we can't do that. Why not? There are a lot of something that says you got to harm people. Is that what you're doing? Right. Yeah. Now, wait a minute. You leave me alone. You got no right to do this to me. Bartender! Come on back here and help. These lousy cops are giving me trouble. Help me. Come on, lady. You're only making it harder on yourself. Leave me alone. Get away from Come me. Come on. Don't cause any more trouble. Now. If you were a gentleman, you wouldn't do this to me. If you were a lady, we wouldn't have to. We took the woman back to the city hall. After several cups of hot coffee, she straightened out enough to give us a story. She went over each step of the previous day, naming all the places she and her daughter had gone and all the foods they'd eaten. There was no apparent cause for the child's death. In talking to her, we found that the child was wearing different clothing when she was brought to the hospital. Frank and I drove out to Mrs. Guyman's sister's home and picked up the dress and the coat the little girl had worn. It was turned over to the crime lab. 2.15 p.m. You and Friday. Yeah. I don't know. We'll have to check it. Right. Yeah, as soon as we know. Right. Right, pink over at the lab. Yeah. Just finished going over the little girl's dress. Fine, is it? Yeah, a couple of stains. Yeah. Traces of poison. Along with the crew from the crime lab, Frank, Mrs. Guyman, and I went back to her apartment where a thorough search was started. From the analysis of the stains found on the child's dress, Sergeant J. Allen said the death might have been caused by minute quantities of poison in another fluid. While he and his crew went over the apartment, Frank and I talked to Mrs. Guyman. Couldn't be anything here. Was the child alone at all yesterday? No, I don't think so. We went to the zoo and came back here. We gave her the doll and we played with that for a while. Mm-hmm. Did you leave the apartment at all? Yeah. Down to the corner to make a phone call. Only gone a couple of minutes. Your daughter was here alone then? Yes, but she couldn't have gotten into anything. I was only gone a little while. I was still playing with the doll when I got back. Miss Guyman, our crime lab seems to think she might have been poisoned by some sort of polish. What do you mean? Looks like a metal polish of some kind. I don't have any of that in the house. You sure? Certainly. I don't know. My place. They have to tear everything up like this. It'll all be straightened out. I hope so. Seems like there's never going to be an end to it. Joe? Yeah, Joe. See you, man. Mm -hmm. What do you got? I think this is how I found out the kitchen under the sink. Metal polish. Yeah. Isn't one of the standard brands. Certainly isn't one of the off brands either, is it? Uh-uh. I've never seen it before. Wow. The bottle's almost empty. Cap was off when we found it. Any chance it might have spilled out? No, it doesn't look like it. Not on the floor around the bottle. If you want to come out in the kitchen, we'll check out the prints. Mm -hmm. They got the kit out there. All right. Can you tell for sure, Jay? No, we can get an idea, though. There, Joe, it's coming through. You see that? Yeah. What do you think? After all, the child's prints, to be sure. It looks like it, though. The fingers are pretty small. Now you can see yourself. Pretty tiny. I well, I guess that does it. Mm-hmm. Right, thanks, Jay. What did they find? Yeah. You know how it happened? We think so, yeah. Oh. We found an empty bottle of metal polish in the kitchen. Looks like your daughter drank some of it. She couldn't have. I was with her all the time. She couldn't have gotten to it. You said you left her alone. But not that long. She didn't have time. I was only gone a couple of minutes. That's all. Just a couple of minutes. That was long enough. It's not true. Just making it up. Trying to make it all my fault. No, ma'am. Yes, you are. You're trying to make out I did kill her. You're saying it's my fault. Well, it isn't. Well, then you tell us. Huh? Whose fault is it? <laughs> The story you've just heard is true. The names were changed to protect the innocent. 
On August 18th, an inquest was held in the coroner's office in and for the county of Los Angeles, state of California. After examining all the evidence, a coroner's jury decided that the death of Melissa June Guyman was due to accidental poisoning. You have just heard Dragnet, the authentic story of your police force in action, and starring Jack Webb, a presentation of the United States Armed Forces Radio Service. have been changed to protect the innocent. You're a detective sergeant. You're assigned a bunco fugitive detail. A secretary tells you her employer has suddenly left town. She says he's taken all the company records with him. Your job? Check it out. It was Monday, May 18th. It was cloudy in Los Angeles. We were working the day watch out of Bunko Fugitive Detail. My partner's Frank Smith. The boss is Captain Didion. My name's Friday. We were on our way back from lunch, and it was 1.46 p.m. when we got to room 38. Bunko Fugitive. Sergeant Friday? That's right. right. They told me to see you. Yes, ma'am. It's my partner, Frank Smith. How do you do? Good afternoon. My name's Gibbons. Claire Gibbons. Would right. you like to sit down there? Thank you. All right. Well? Yes, ma'am? It isn't anything when you put your finger on it. At least, it isn't anything I'm sure of. Mm-hmm. It wasn't even my idea, coming to the police. Mama said I... I mean, my mother advised me to discuss this matter with you. I see. She's always claimed there was something funny about my job. She said this just goes to prove it. I'm sure she's mistaken. Sure, Mr. Orlean wouldn't do anything wrong. Mr. Orlean? Oh, he's my boss, my employer, Henry Orlean. Mm-hmm. The thing is, he's disappeared. Yeah. All of a sudden. I wanted to see him last. Friday. Friday evening when I left the office, 5 p.m. Have you checked with his home? I, I don't know where he lives. He never told me. I see. He's never gone out of town before. Not since I started working for him. Well, how long has that been? Seven months. Seven months on the third. What kind of business is he in? Uranium. Uranium stock. Mm-hmm. Multiple Uranium Investments Incorporated. That's the name of his company. I see. Well, don't the other employees have any idea where he went? There aren't any other employees. I'm the only one. Oh, I see. Have you talked to missing persons? No. No, I haven't. You see, Mama doesn't think he's missing. She says he skipped out, that he's a crook. Does your mother know this, Mr. Orlean? Only what I've told her about him. They've never met. She's been suspicious from the very beginning, though. Fred, I don't follow you. Well, it's... Well, it's kind of hard to explain. How's that? Well, you see, the thing is, Mama just can't understand why he ever hired me. Hmm? The employment office sent me to see him, along with seven or eight other secretaries. Mr. Orlin picked me out from all the rest. Was well, there something strange in that? Well... The truth is, I'm not much of a stenographer. Not a real good one, that is. 
I get kind of nervous whenever I have to take dictation. My typing's just fair, too. I could do real clean copy if they'd just let me take my time, but they never do. Is that right? Except for Mr. Orlin. He doesn't rush me or get me all upset. It's the first time I've ever been able to hang on to a job. Pays awful good. Twenty dollars a week more than I ever earned before. That's so? Mom couldn't believe it when I told her. She said there's a catch to it someplace. Mm-hmm. It'd be different if I was... Well, if I wasn't plain. Two or three of the other girls who tried out for Mr. Orland, they were very attractive, and they all had nice clothes. Mm-hmm. Mama sure was surprised when I told her he'd picked me. There's a catch to it somewhere, that's how she put it. He's up to something, and he wants a secretary who's not too bright. Well, I'm afraid we're going to need more than that to start an investigation, Miss Gibbons. Yes, sir. I see. Well, thank you very much. Just a minute. Does he owe you any back wages? Oh, no. No, I'm paid up a month in advance. Mm Mm-hmm. That was another thing that seemed funny. I mean, when you think about it now, it seems funny. What do you mean? My being with him less than a year and him wanting me to take a vacation with pay a whole month off. How'd that come about? Well, it was just last week, uh, Monday. Mm Mm-hmm. A week ago today when he brought up the subject. He said it was getting on towards summer, and I ought to start thinking about where I wanted to go on my vacation. Yeah. I told him I I didn't feel entitled to a vacation yet. He just smiled and said it was up to him to decide that. But he's the boss, wasn't he? Then he insisted I tell him just where I wanted to go. I couldn't think of any place at all. He finally asked me why I didn't visit my sister in Hawaii. I see. She's married to a Navy officer stationed in Honolulu. I guess I must have mentioned her to Mr. Orlin. I, I guess that's the time I knew about her. Yes, ma'am, must be. But the idea of ever paying her a visit hadn't even crossed my mind. Mm-hmm. I tried to argue with him, but he pretended to get mad and told me if I was a good enough secretary to deserve a holiday, he's going to see that I got it. And then he said he'd make up for it when I got back, that he'd really pour the work on. Mm-hmm. I knew he wasn't serious about pouring the work on, but it did seem like he really wanted me to go to Hawaii. Well, why didn't you take him up on it? Well, I meant to. I had my ticket. Round trip flight. Mr. Orlin paid for it, just like he said he would. Yeah. I was supposed to leave Saturday night. I sent Anne an airmail letter telling her all about the trip. But that's my sister, Anne Burcott. Yeah. Well, Saturday morning she wired me not to come. Her husband's being transferred in a week or two. Well, she wasn't sure where. Maybe back to the States. I see. Oh, I suppose I could have made the trip anyway, but it wouldn't be any fun going someplace where I didn't know anybody. I, I don't make friends very easy. Is that so? Well, I, I didn't know just what to do, whether Mr. Orland would still want me to take the month off or not. I went down to the office this morning to talk to him about it. He wasn't there. Everything was gone. Yeah? From the safe, all records, and stock certificates, everything. Corporation papers he had framed up on the wall, they were gone, too. Had somebody broken in? I don't think so. The door to the suit was locked when I got there. I had my key. And what about safe? I don't understand. Well, was the safe open or closed? Closed. Well, how'd you happen to look inside? I telephoned my mother and told her that Mr. Orland wasn't there, and she said I'd better check and see if anything was missing. Said it sounded to her like he'd skipped out. Mm Mm-hmm. After I looked in the safe, she told me to get in touch with the police. Well, now, just exactly what sort of business was this uranium company? Mr. Orland invested in various uranium stocks. For other people? Yes, that's right. Which bank did he use? Western National. The account's in the main branch. I'll give him a call, Jim. Yeah, okay. Well, there just wouldn't be any reason for him to run away, would there? Well, it's pretty hard to tell, yeah. I mean, he's doing a real good business. Well, that might be a reason. Oh? Do you know the names of his customers? What, the people who invested, Mr. Orland? That's right. Mm-hmm. Well, I guess I could remember some of them. The books are gone, though. I wouldn't be able to recall them all. I see. The old customers, the ones who've been with us for several months, I'd remember them. Uh-huh. Was the business new when you started to work with them? Yes, sir. Brand new. Did you find out anything? Yeah. Orlean closed out the Mullable Uranium Bank account last Friday evening, a little before six. Six? Yeah. Banks, they open late on Friday. Oh, yeah, I forgot. How much did he withdraw? Just under 100000 A lot of money. Yeah. I guess Mama was right about him. Mm-hmm. 
it's starting to look that way. I should have known. From the beginning, I should have known. What? She's always right. While Frank put in a call to Sacramento to check on the corporate status of multiple uranium investments, I asked Clara Gibbons to give me a detailed description of the suspect. 2.28 p.m., Sacramento reported that no such corporation had ever been authorized. We ran the name Henry Orlean through R&I. They had nothing on him. We turned the description and M.O. over to the stats office. They came up with seven possible stock fraud artists. We pulled their mug shots and showed them to Miss Gibbons. She was unable to identify any of the pictures. 3.07 p.m., Miss Gibbons accompanied us to the Wendler building on Wilshire Boulevard in the Miracle Mile. We went up to Suite 4D. Just a second till I find my key. Yes, ma'am. Well, here it is. This is the outer office where I work. Mm-hmm. mm-hmm. That's his office in there? Yes, sir. Well, that's real fancy. Have you talked to the building manager today? No, sir. Is he around, do you know? Well, there isn't any manager. Not exactly. The owner has an office down the hall. Oh, I'll be glad to find out if he's in. Thank you. Uh, you'll be here? Yes, ma'am. Well, very impressive quarters, huh? Must have been a very impressive guy. Yeah. Look at that, Joe. I wonder what he had up there. Hmm? Up on the wall. See that spot? Looks like there used to be a picture or something. Well, those incorporation papers, maybe, huh? Phonies. I don't know. As far as the state of California is concerned, they're phonies. Mm-hmm. This is Mr. Wendler. Mr. Wendler, this is Sergeant Friday. How are you? How do you? This is... I'm awfully sorry. I don't seem to remember your name. Sorry, right. My name's Frank Smith. Well, pleased to meet you. This is our identification. You must say. Forget him. Uh-huh. Well, you're the owner of this building, are you? Well, it's the Wendler building. I'm Ted Wendler. Yes, sir. Draw your own conclusions. Yeah. Do you have any objections to answering a few questions, Wendler? No. All right. Will you answer them for us, please? I thought I was. Yes, sir. I asked you one before. Do you own this building? All right. That isn't important. Well, it's important to me. It's important to the mortgage company. Is it in your name? Yes, it's in my name. All right, fine. And what about the man who rented this suite? Orlean? Yes, sir. Well, what about him? Do you know he left town? Well, she just told me. Do you know about it before? No. What can you tell us about him? He was a broker or something. Uranium stocks, I guess. Yeah, we got that much. That's all you know about him, huh? Yeah. How long has he rented from you? Let's see, a little over seven months. Uh, the eight on the third. Did he mention anything about where he had offices before? No, he said he was from back east. Any particular place? No. Why, what's he done? Then I talk to him, that's all. Well, maybe he'll come back. Uh-huh. Well, if he doesn't, it's all the same to me. What? I made him pay his rent in advance whole first year. Is that your usual practice? No, only with fellas in the stock market. You see, I remember 1929. Yeah. You never know what's going to happen, not with fellas in the market. Mm-hmm. You see, I remember 29. Yeah. If all these stays away, I'm way ahead of him. Rent's paid up. Mm-hmm. I'm nearly five months ahead of him. Yes, sir. I wish we were. Ted Wendler confirmed Miss Gibbons' description of the suspect and insisted he could tell us nothing further about the man. While a crew from the crime lab went over the offices, we again questioned Clara Gibbons. She gave us the names and addresses of some of the people who had invested money with Orlean. 4.48 p.m., the crime lab reported that they'd been unable to discover any useful fingerprints in the suite. The only physical evidence they had uncovered was a copy of a prospectus which purported to list various securities owned by multiple uranium investments. It had fallen behind a filing cabinet. The next day, May 19th, Frank and I checked with several of the uranium companies listed on the prospectus. They all informed us that none of their stock had ever been purchased by Multiple Uranium Incorporated or Henry Orlean. 3.13 p.m., Frank and I drove out to interview one of the victims. Would you like to sit down? Thank you. Miss Custis, do you know a man named Henry Orlean? Yes. Yes, I know him. Why? Did you ever invest any money with him? $5,000. Nothing's happened to Mr. Orlean. We're not sure yet. How'd you happen to give him the money? Well, it was some insurance my husband left me. Yes, ma'am. I'd kept it in savings, didn't bring in much interest. When I heard about Mr. Orlean's company... Where did you hear about it? Do you remember? At the hospital. Ma'am? St. Agnes Children's Hospital. Oh? I spend a day a week there helping out in the charity ward. I'm on some of the committees, too. You know, fundraising, things like that. Yes, ma'am. Oh, I'm not one of the big people behind the work, but somebody has to get out and dig for the little donations, too. Yes, ma'am, they do. And I have quite a bit of free time now. Do you remember who it was that first mentioned Mr. Orlean to you? I... I think it was Mrs. Lorrington. Lorrington? Yes, Mrs. Arthur Lorrington. You must have heard of her. She does so much charity work around town. She's very prominent socially. Yes, ma'am. Just what did she say about Mr. Orlean's company? 
Well, she wasn't talking to me exactly. One afternoon, when she was showing some people the plans for the new clinic, mm -hmm. I guess she was asking them for some contributions. That's how it sounded. And one of the ladies said it all depended on how well her husband's stocks did during the next quarter. I see. And Mrs. Lawrenson laughed and told her her husband ought to be in multiple uranium, that he wouldn't have anything to worry about. Go on. Well, that was all I heard. They went on to the next room. Afterwards, I got to thinking, if this uranium stock was good enough for Mrs. Law, you maybe I ought to check into it. You know, you're always hearing about people making fortunes in uranium. Yes, ma'am. Well, I looked up the company in the phone book and talked to Mr. Orlean. First, he wasn't very anxious for me to invest, but when I told him I knew Mrs. Lawrington, he said he'd take me in as a favor to her. When was all this? Oh, about four months ago. Have you seen Mr. Orlean since? No. You heard from him? Not directly. I get a dividend check every month, though. Stock's paying very well. I figured it out. On a yearly basis, it'll come to over 30%. You can't do much better than that. Well, ma'am. I told some of my friends about it, too, so they could get in on it. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you very much, ma'am. You still haven't explained what this is all about. Well, we're trying to get in touch with Mr. Orlean, that's all. Oh, the Wendler building on Wilshire Boulevard. That's where his office is, the Wendler building. Yes, ma'am. Isn't he there? No, he isn't. I don't understand. Orlean seems to have disappeared. What? What about my money? I'm afraid that went with him. Why, well, that isn't possible. He couldn't have. Mrs. Lawrence said it was a good stock. Yes, ma'am. We'll talk to her about it. Well, he paid me dividends every month. Good dividends. Yeah, well, I wouldn't count on any more of them. What? Why, well, I'll bring charges against him. I'll have him put in jail. He'll find out. But that's all you need, isn't it? Somebody to bring charges? No, ma'am. Not quite. Well, what do you mean? We need him. Frank and I left Mrs. Custis and drove out to interview another victim, Mrs. J.T. Pressing on Highland Avenue. She told us that she had invested $8,000 in multiple uranium. She also told us that she had first heard about the stock through a friend who was on the fundraising committee for St. Agnes Hospital. We interviewed three more victims. All of them were in some way associated with the hospital or were acquainted with Mrs. Arthur Lorrington. 8.45 p.m., we drove up to the Lorrington estate in Bel Air. A maid showed us into the library and said that Mrs. Lorrington would see us in a few minutes. Hey, Joe. Yeah. That's her. Hmm? Up there on the wall, that painting, that's Mrs. Lawrence. Yeah. Saw it in the Sunday paper once. Society page. Mm -hmm. Real honest to gosh. Artist, did it? You don't say. Mm hmm. Probably flatters her a lot. Maybe. Well, it's bound to. What makes you think so? Well, it stands to reason, Joe. If all a person wants is a good likeness, a photographer ought to do the trick. Yeah. Artists know that, too. They do. Mm hmm. Figures they want something else. Want to look better, so he flatters them. Oh, I see. That's the way it works. Are you gentlemen waiting for me? Ms. Lorrington? That's right. We're police officers. Ms. Frank Smith, my name's Friday. Well, I, I'm sure it's my husband you want to talk to. Unfortunately, he's in San Francisco on a business trip. No, ma'am. We'd like to talk to you, if you don't mind. You know a man named Henry Orlean? Orlean? That's it, yeah. Hmm, the name sounds familiar, but I meet so many people, it's hard to be certain. Have you ever heard of a stock called Multiple Uranium Incorporated? Oh, yes, yes, of course. Well, I didn't associate the two for a moment. That's Mr. Orlean's company, isn't it? Yes, ma'am. Do you have any money invested in that stock? No, not me personally, but I can vouch for the company if that's what you want to know. Mm -hmm. You see, I'm on the fundraising committee for St. Agnes Hospital. Matter of fact, I'm the chairman. Yes, ma'am, we know. And we do own some of Mr. Orlean's stock. The hospital, that is. But tell us, how'd you happen to buy it? Oh, we didn't. It was a donation. Would you mind telling us from who? Oh, no, not yet. Mr. Orlean himself. I see. When did he give it to you? Uh, last year, September. Yes, it was September. Charity Bazaar. I don't recall the exact date, but I can find out for you. Well, September's close enough. Just what was this bazaar? A party here at my home. We opened the grounds to the general public. A garden party and auction combined. An auction? Mm -hmm. Some of the most picture people donated the items we sold, and all the money went to the hospital. Mm -hmm. We raised over $25,000, not counting what Mr. Orlean gave us. That's the stock donation. That's right? right. He congratulated me on the bazaar. He seemed to be very interested in charity work. I said we would certainly use his help, and he offered to do whatever he could. What? He said that, unfortunately, he couldn't give us cash at the moment. He mumbled something about a tax problem. I'm not really too clear about those things. Everyone seems to be having tax problems nowadays. Mm -hmm. So, instead of an outright gift, he offered us a block of stock in his company. Now, just how much stock was involved? Mm, 500 shares, I think. Just something like that. At any rate, he said the market value of what he was giving us would be in the neighborhood of $10,000. Did he tell you anything else about it? Well, he didn't go into the details of his corporation, and I certainly didn't question him. He was 
Don't look a gift horse in the mouth. Yes, ma'am. All I recall, he said his company owned shares in other uranium companies so that the money was well diversified. Now, was that all? Mm, yes, I believe so. Except that he made one request. What was it? He asked me not to sell the stock for at least a year. Did he give you a reason? Oh, yes. He said that within a year's time, it would double in market value. And in the meantime, the hospital would be receiving excellent dividends. I see. As a matter of fact, the dividends have been remarkable. Mm -hmm. Something like $500 a month, I believe, our treasurer told me. Mr. Orlean must be a very shrewd investor. Did you ever discuss this uranium stock with any of your friends, Mrs. Lawrence? Why, yes, once or twice. One of our committee meetings, when we were going over the books, we were surprised at the return it was paying us. We all talked about it then. I suppose I may have mentioned it since. Mm -hmm. Just in conversation. Yes, ma'am. Is Mr. Orlean upset that I told other people about his company? I didn't know he wanted it kept secret. Oh, no, he wanted you to tell him. Well, then. Several people that you discussed multiple uranium with invested in the company as a result. Well, it's a perfectly sound investment. No, ma'am. What? Orlean has disappeared, and so has their money. Sure, your mistake. The stock he sold him was phony. So was the stock he gave your hospital fund. It couldn't be. Look at the dividends they paid. That was just good advertising. You mean he used the hospital? He used me? I'm afraid so. Well, I, I just don't know what to say. I've never been involved in a situation like this before. Yes, ma'am. It's terribly distressing. I, well, I know it's not my fault, but... I, I can't help thinking I should have been more careful, more discreet. Mm. Well, I'm sorry. I'm, I'm afraid you'll have to excuse me. I, I don't feel like talking anymore. I'm very upset. We understand. Anita will show you out. We'll find a way. Let's go. Oh. Mm. I was just looking at that painting up there again. No, I was right, Joe. Hmm? Flatters you. The interview with Mrs. Lorrington had enabled us to establish the suspect's M.O. Additional bulletins were sent out alerting all police departments, charity organizations, and fundraising committees. During the rest of the week, we interviewed other victims of the stock swindle. None of them could furnish any additional information about the whereabouts of the man who called himself Henry Orlean. Three weeks later, on June 9th, we received a report from the Chicago Police Department. They informed us that a man answering Orlean's description had worked an oil stock swindle in that city during the previous year. He had then used the name of Roger Norgan. They also told us that this Norgett was suspected of an earlier stock swindle in Kansas City. Neither the Chicago nor Kansas City police had a positive identification of the suspect, but in both cities, the M.O. had been the same. The suspect had donated a block of phony stock to a charitable organization, had paid very high dividends on the donated shares, and then had been able to acquire investments from private persons. Wednesday, June 11th, 3.17 p.m., Frank and I were in the office. Sergeant Friday? Yes, ma'am. You remember me, Clara Gibbons? I used to work for yes, Mr. Orlean. Yes, ma'am. How are you? What can we do for you? Mama just found him. Hmm? Mama just found him, Mr. Orlean. Where? Over on Hill Street. She was just walking along and she saw him. Is she sure it's him? Positive. Please hurry. Oh, just a minute, Miss Gibbons. Yeah, what is it? Didn't she tell us your mother had never seen this man? Well, she's seen him now. He was walking down Hill well, Street. Why does she know it's him if she never saw him before? I told her what he looked like dozens of times, all about him. I see. For heaven's sake, you don't have to see a person to know what he looks like. Mama would recognize Mr. Orlin anywhere. She said so half a dozen times. She can describe him better than I can. No. My mother's very intelligent, Sergeant. She's not like me. Now, please don't stand here and argue about it or he'll get away. Well, just where is he? The Norbridge Hotel, corner of Hill and Hall. I thought your mother saw him on the street. Well, she followed him into the hotel. She didn't want to lose him. He went upstairs and she telephoned me from the lobby. She said she'd wait there to make sure he didn't leave. Oh, I see. She told me to bring you as soon as I could. It's nearly half an hour since she called me. We haven't got much time. All right, Miss Gibbons. All right, we'll check on it right away. You're going to arrest him, aren't you? If it's the right man. Well, of course it's the right man. Mm -hmm. Excuse me a minute. Do you have to answer it now? I'll go fugitive Friday. Yeah, that's right. I see. Fine. Okay. We'll forward our warrant to you. Will you send us a notification by telegram? Thank you. We sure are. Many thanks. Salt Lake City Police Department. Yeah? Picked up Orlean this morning. Had him from our circular. They sure it's him? Gave him a full confession. Admitted the KC and Chicago deals, too. But it <laughs> couldn't be, Mr. Orlean. He's at the Norbridge Hotel. Well, Miss Gibbons, I'm afraid your mother was mistaken. I've never known Mama to make a mistake. No, we all make them. But, well, she's waiting for us at the hotel. What'll I tell her? Well, let's see. I guess there's only one thing. What's that? Tell her not to wait. <laughs> The story you've just heard is true. 
The names were changed to protect the innocent. On August 16th, trial was held in Department 98, Superior Court of the State of California, in and for the County of Los Angeles. Francis Caxton Wheatley, alias Henry Orlean, alias Roger Norgett, was tried and convicted of grand theft, seven counts, and received sentence as prescribed by law. Grand theft is punishable by imprisonment in the county jail for no more than one year, or in the state prison for not less than one or more than ten years. Holes were placed on the suspect by the states of Illinois and Missouri at the termination of his sentence in San Quentin. You have just heard Dragnet, the authentic story of your police force in action, and starring Jack Webb, a presentation of the United States Armed Forces Radio Service. 